you know, you know when you're censoring. Testing one to make the point better. Like your sound can also be better. Yeah. Sounds because you're hearing like things that aren't the fellow, right? You're picking up on that.
Foreign and Commissioner, just uh, some housekeeping matters to begin with. Uh, there are two volumes of policies and procedures that have been uh, that were served on the parties last week. Um, they're fairly weighty volumes, but uh, I tender those two volumes. Eighteen point zero zero four. Also, two further documents um, that have also been served on the parties. Um, the discipline and termination policy. So the policies and procedures are of Hillsong yes, they are. or um, a ACCC? There's, there's a combination. There are some Hillsong and some Northside um, and some Australian Christian churches' policies and procedures. Mm. And then they're divided between national and state policies. So there are some national policies, then there are Victorian, New South Wales and Queensland policies within that bundle. Thank you. One, one policy that, that is not in that, in those two volumes, is the discipline and termination policy of Hillsong Church, dated the 31st of July 2008. That has been served and um, a copy will be handed up now. I tender that. Thank you. 18.005. And the last matter for, for uh, tender is a letter uh, from Kerry Boland, the Acting Commissioner and Children's Guardian, New South <coughs> Wales, um, to Mr Tony Juni, Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Royal Commission. <coughs> dated the 1st of October 2014. So that letter will be marked 18.006. Um, I call Pastor Barbara Taylor. Just remain standing for a moment, Pastor Taylor. Now, would you like to take the oath or the affirmation? The oath. Right. So if you raise the Bible, please, in your right hand. Thank you. And repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. In this Royal Commission. In this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. So if you just give the Bible back to Ms Hong and just take a seat right where you are. Thank you. Thank you. I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission. Barbara Frances Taylor. Thank you. And um, you've provided an address to the Royal Commission. That's right, isn't it? Sorry, I didn't hear. You have provided an address to the Royal Commission. Yes. And you have also provided us with a statement dated the 29th of September 2014. I'm sorry, but I can't hear you. Yeah, you're unable I probably to hear me. need some. Yes, we'll have some headphones made available to you.
side stain. Hold it. Is, is that any better? No. No. Ah. Is yes. that any better? Yeah, thank you, yes. yes. Did you provide a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 29th of September 2014? I did. And is that statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? It is. I tender the statement. 18.007. Now, Pastor, I understand that um, you've been the pastor at Emmanuel Christian Family Church since 1977, is that right? That's correct. And that's a Pentecostal church? Yes. And um, since that time, it's been affiliated with the Assemblies of God? Um, 1989, it became affiliated with the Assemblies of God. And um, when the Assemblies of God changed its name to Australian Christian Churches, I presume you kept up affiliation? Yes, I did. <coughs> Um, and that church is located in Plumpton, New South Wales, is that right? Correct. Yes, which is uh, some, somewhat near uh, Mount Druitt, is that right? It's part of Mount Druitt. Um, now, in about um, mid-1998... You say uh, the mother of AHA, you know who I'm referring to by AHA? Yes. Um, so AHA's mother came to you and had a conversation with you about um, her son. Is that right? She actually asked me to go to her home. All right. And when, she, when you were there, what did she say to you about AHA? Uh, she said that uh, Pastor Frank Houston had behaved inappropriately with her son and he didn't want anyone to know about it. He felt shame. Well, when you say um, behaved in inappropriately, did she, did she say specifically what um, Pastor Houston had done to her son? Yes. What did she say? She said that he came into the room where he was asleep when Pastor Houston shared uh, a room uh, with the lad and uh, put his hands down his pyjamas and, and uh, touched him inappropriately. Um, was that on one occasion or more than one occasion? That was never discussed, just the fact he did it. And um, <clears throat> when she disclosed that to you, what, what did you determine needed to be done with that allegation? She asked me not to tell anybody. You knew it was um, a serious allegation against a senior member of the... Yes. ..of the... The Assemblies of God, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. Um, but you're saying that you, you kept the confidence at that stage of that. I, I did. All right. Um, <clears throat> back in 1998, what did you understand the process was within the Assemblies of God for dealing with allegations of child sexual abuse against a pastor? I hadn't particularly considered that aspect, but I knew if there was any misconduct, it should go firstly to the uh, area, then to the state, and then to the national. That's what I understood. All right. And um, when you say the area, do you mean the district office? The, of the district, area? yes. And where is that district in, uh, in Sydney? That would be the Norwest district for me. And, um, and would you be, at that stage, did you understand that it would be passed on to the state or were you required to report it to the state? I just understood if you took it to the uh, 
area, it would automatically be passed on if the allegation were found to be uh, worthy of investigation. All right, now... Um, <clears throat> kept a, um, a chronology of the events that occurred with respect to this matter, didn't you? I did. And that's annexed to your statement. Yes. I'll have that brought up on the screen so you can see it easily. It's an extra A to Pastor Taylor's statement. On the 27th of October 1998, it appears that you rang AHA's mother uh, to discuss the matter, is that right? Yes, to see if anything had been done. And what were you expecting had been done? Well, I really wanted to know if I was released, if she was released me to do something about it. You went, were you expecting her or her son to do anything about the allegations? Not at that stage. So the next step appears to be the 3rd of November 1998, is that right? Yes. And... <clears throat> you say that um, AHA's mother confided in Kevin and... And Deanne, is that how you pronounce it, Mudford? Deanne Mudford, yes. Now, what was what was that occasion? Was that at your church? Was that somewhere else? Yes, it was at Emmanuel Church. There was a tent erected and we were having a crusade. And that particular night, people were sharing their experiences and it came up that there were many people there that had suffered child abuse and uh, the effect that it had on their life. And um, on that occasion, AHA's mother disclosed the, um, the abuse to Kevin Mudford, is that right? I wasn't there. Yes. I was, it was unknown that she did that till the next day. I see. Um, so... You weren't aware on the 3rd of November that that, that, that had happened? No, I was, I was unaware that had happened. Um, so the sequence of events then is, um, well, what happened on the 4th of November 1998 then? The day after, uh, Kevin asked me to go to John McMartin, who was his pastor, and also a member of the state executive, uh, I was shocked that uh, AHA's mother had revealed what I was told to keep in confidence. All right. Um, we heard yesterday about uh, a meeting between Mr Mudford and AHA. In fact, what he determined he said, was a confrontation. It was. At his house. It was. Did, did that happen, happen before or after um, the request to go and um, discuss the matter with John McMahon? Uh, this happened after we had discussed <coughs> the matter with John McMartin. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go back then, firstly, to the McMartin matter. Now... Yes. John McMartin at that stage was an executive member of the state yes. branch of the AOG, is that right? Yes, correct. And so by raising it with him, you considered that to be the, the appropriate process to have the matter dealt with? Yes, but I have to say here that we did not disclose the name of the person, persons involved. Yes. Um, did you describe... Um, I think you say you described uh, the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator to Mr McMartin as a senior pastor within the Assemblies of God, is that right? Yes. And you also 
described the the alleged victim as being a child at the time of the at the time of the incident he was a child yes um, now did you actually have a conversation with mr mcmartin uh, I was with uh, Kevin Mudford, who did most of the talking, uh, but uh, I don't recall saying too much. Uh, Kevin was uh, uh, most upset with Frank Houston. And he, he expressed that anger to Mr McMartin, did he? Not really. It, no, it was when he saw Brett that he expressed the anger towards right. Frank. All right, let's go back a moment then. So you had the meeting with Pastor McMartin. Where yes. Did that, where did that occur? At his church in Liverpool. In Liverpool. And uh, what's the name of that church, do you know? I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh, they've changed their name. I don't know their so, modern name. So, in any event, um, Mr Mudford did most of the talking, he you did. say. He and did. And he conveyed the allegations to Pastor McMartin, is yes. that right? Yes. And what did he say about the allegations? What did he say the allegations were? Only that Frank Houston had... Well, he didn't mention his name that this particular minister had behaved inappropriately 30 years before with a young boy. Did he use that term inappropriately or did he say sexual abuse or did he describe what had occurred? Honestly, I don't remember what words he used. In any event, you recall that um, it was conveyed to Pastor McMartin that there had been some form of inappropriate conduct? Very much so. And was there, was there any doubt in your mind that that included some form of, or meant some form of sexual abuse of a child? Not in my mind, and not in Kevin's mind, I believe. Um, so then there was a meeting on the 5th of November, 1998. Yes. And uh, that occurred at AHA's home, is that right? Yeah, that is correct. And... Uh, Kevin Mudford got there first, is that right? He did. He was uh, very agitated. And um, to your understanding, why was he agitated? He was angry about Frank Houston. He wasn't angry with AHA. All right. Um, AHA says that uh, one of the reasons that, AHA, that um, Mr... Mudford was angry was because put this directly to you. That he said that AHA must have made up the story about Pastor Frank. I was surprised to hear that. All right. So when you were there at the house and you arrived after Mr Mudford, is that right? Just seconds after. All right. Had to, um, did it appear that uh, Mr Mudford was uh, having a conversation or had had a conversation with... No, I withdraw that. Um, <clears throat> So you're not aware of that being put to um, AHA? I'm not aware of that. And... During that conversation that you had with AHA and Kevin Mudford, what did what did AHA say to you about the allegations? It wasn't a normal conversation. It was like a shouting match. And AHA was very disturbed and shocked to think his mother had told anybody. 
did you form the opinion that this was the first time he had heard um, that somebody outside of his family knew about the allegation? I had that impression. And at the, at the end of the conversation, was there some decision about what would happen next? It wasn't that type of conversation. All right. Now... So you came away from the meeting and what did you decide to do? I think I was in a state of shock myself. <coughs> you say at uh, paragraph 14 that you um, took some advice from an independent counselling practice. Yes. And that advice was not to go ahead with the victim and initiate and actions um, he had not sanctioned, is that right? That's correct. Her name is Cheryl Lewin. <clears throat> and then at paragraph 15, you say that the investigation proceeded at a slow pace. Yes. Um, what investigation was and who was, who was undertaking that investigation? I was endeavouring to get Frank Houston to meet with AHA, but I was unsuccessful. All right. Do I take it then that you'd, you'd assume some level of responsibility to, to progress the matter, to do something about, yes. the, about the allegations? I really tried unsuccessfully, I have to say. Um, can I ask you, please, Pastor, what happened um, as a result of the meeting with Pastor McMartin? So you have a meeting with with him on the um, on the fourth of November, nineteen ninety eight. What did he say from the AOG's perspective would be the next step? He didn't say. Did you form an impression that he was going to do anything further? I assumed he would have. Did he ever write to you and say what the process was? No. Um, did he ask whether you would convey a letter to the uh, to the victim to explain the process at that no. stage? No, he did say at one stage, I think it's in recorded in one of the letters, that there was a, a structure in place in the Assemblies of God uh, where something would be done. We'll come to that. I certainly understand there's that September 1999 letter where he says that. Yes. Um, but let's just go back and finish off 1998. Right. Um, now, you said you attempted to contact Pastor Houston. Is that correct? On many occasions. Now, was that... Had you asked AHA whether that was acceptable to him? Yes. And um, what did he say? It was. Um, and so you uh, you tried to contact him, is that right? Yes. And you say on the 25th of November you called Pastor Houston, but he was in a meeting. He called you back and said he would see AHA. So this is Frank or Brian? Thank you, Your Honour. Frank. Thank you, Your Honour. So you, if we go back to an extra A and your uh, your chronology, if that could come up, I'd say it. Thank you.
at his right to proceed legally. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and yesterday, AHA said that um, he didn't go to a chamber magistrate, but in effect went to a solicitor. Yes. Um, does that reflect your memory? Was it a chamber magistrate or was it a solicitor, do you recall? Uh, I can only say what AHA said to me. As far as I recall, he said it was to a chamber magistrate to find out his rights. And then you said to him, if he goes to the church, I will stand with you, but mm -hmm. if you go to the secular courts, I will not. I, d I did. Can you just explain, perhaps, for the assistance of the Royal Commission, why you um, took that stance? I felt the church should uh, deal, discipline Frank Houston and stand him down immediately and then go to the secular courts. I felt the church had a responsibility to clean up its own house. Um, now, secular courts, um, do you mean the criminal courts, the civil courts, or both? Pardon my ignorance, but I just meant to take it to court, to a court. <clears throat> Did you consider in your mind whether the matter should be referred to the police at that stage? No. Did you discuss, discuss going to the police with... Mr AHA at that stage in November 1998? No, he was horrified to think anyone knew about it and I didn't think he would go to the police. Now, you wrote a letter to Pastor Frank Houston on the 26th of February 1999, is that right? Yes. And should B will come up on the screen in a moment. Somewhat difficult to read. Yes, it's a long time ago. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to say, because of the sensitive nature of a much-needed meeting with AHA, I decided to write this invitation for you to speak with him in my office rather than mention anything last Tuesday when you were accompanied by your daughter. Does that sound right? That's correct. That was at a special meeting and he was there with his daughter. And, um, but you didn't discuss the allegations on that occasion? No. It would have been inappropriate, I thought. And you say, at the resolving of this issue, I expect the Holy Ghost to minister healing to all. I personally have no intention of taking this further. Do you see that? I do. And then later, in the third paragraph, you say, you have told me personally you were willing to talk to him to resolve the matter, and so I am inviting you to come to uh, 280 Jersey Road, Plumpton, on Monday mm -hmm. or Tuesday at 3pm. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and that's the address of your church, is it? It's the ad That's correct. And so your idea was to have... AHA and um So Frank Houston and AHA at that stage did it. 
no meeting occurred when I was there ever. Um, and then on the 6th of April 1999, you sent a fax, a fax to Pastor Houston. I did. Um, if an extra C could come up, please. <clears throat> waited till 5pm for your phone call. Have waited two weeks since your return from Africa. This matter needs to be addressed. This week is the deadline after five months since the matter was first raised by the evangelist. That's a reference to Mr Mudford, isn't it? It is. John McMartin has been approached already by the evangelist. Um, and that was, the, that was the meeting that you had some months ago in 1998. Yes. And procrastination is not the answer, but I am concerned that time is running out. Do you see that? I do. All right. And... Did you receive a response to that fact? I don't believe I did. I can't remember receiving a response. No. Well, let's. I'll just take you back to an extra A. And if you could read the entry for that date. Mm-hmm. He did. Now you say he, he rang and was extremely angry. What was he angry about? That I was pursuing him. About these serious allegations? Yes. Did he suggest at that stage um, any involvement of the Assemblies of God State Executive Office? I don't believe so. What about the National Executive Office of the AOG? I don't believe he said anything like that. He was angry. Then if we get, just go further down, you say, heard absolutely nothing from Frank. Mm -hmm. And then... And then the second week of May, you have a call from AHA who tells you about a conversation he had had with with Pastor Frank. You see that? Um, sorry, what date was that? It says the second week of May in your chronology. Yes, I see it. Thank you. So there was a, what you've termed here a prolonged apology. Do you, do you recall what AHA said about that apology? What, what were the words used? I think he said he cried. AHA was convinced in his mind, his perception was, it was just crocodile tears. In the sense that it wasn't a proper or genuine apology, is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Now, you followed up with um, a letter dated the... Um, 13th? ...of May, or the 19th of May, 1999. Now, we've got um, oh, yes. a very, what appears to be a very poor copy... Yes. ...of that letter... Um, but at Annexia F, there's a typed out version of that particular letter. Did you type that out yourself? I did, actually. <coughs> and it's a transcription of that earlier hard-to-read letter of the same date. Is that right? That's correct. And you, in that letter you were writing to Pastor McMartin? I was. And you say in that letter that 
going back to the first meeting between you, Mr Mudford and Pastor McMartin, there at the end of that second paragraph, you see, you then suggested we go to Brian Houston, but we said we did not feel we could do that. Do you see that? I do. All right. So that's a reference to the conversation you'd had back in, I think it was November, with... John uh, McMartin. With John McMartin. Is that right? Yes. And um, what was his suggestion that you go to Brian Houston? Um, I'll, put that, I'll withdraw that and put that another way. Was he suggesting that you take the allegations to Brian Houston for him to deal with? If I wrote that there, that's what happened. Um, and I had forgotten that. And it says here, but we said we did not feel we could do that. Why was that? Because it was his father. He was... Uh, loved by everybody, and I only had one case that I knew about to go on. All right. Um, and if you go to the next paragraph, talk about writing to the perpetrator. And then you say the perpetrator at first had convenient amnesia, saying if he had done anything out of place, he was sorry. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? Yes. And did you form that opinion on the basis of having conversations with Pastor Frank Houston? I did. And uh, those conversations occurred prior to the 19th of May, 1999? Um, what was the 19th of May? Well, prior to the, to the writing of this particular letter. Yes, must have been. And then if we go further down, it says, the perpetrator rang the victim this week, saying he had shed buckets of tears and agonised for the incident. He at first tried to trivialise the incident, but has admitted it on the phone. Do you see that? Yes. Now, um, the trivialisation and the admission, was that a reference to the phone call that Pastor Frank had with AHA, or was that um, something Pastor Frank had said to you? I would say I don't remember, but I would suggest that it's what the conversation he had with AHA and was repeated to me. And then if we go to the bottom of the page, the second last sentence there, he said, and this is a reference to AHA, he wants to put the matter on hold at the moment for he is too upset to continue with anything at the moment mm. and, I, and I detected he is angry. Is that yeah, correct? That is correct. And then if we go over the page... towards the end of that. So progress made is that now that the victim can talk about the incident to some degree and that the perpetrator has acknowledged that he did behave with a seven-year-old boy in such a way as would have, have him classified an ex-pedophile. Do you see that? Yes. So, you, so it's reasonable to say that you uh, put Mr McMartin on notice that there were allegations about a senior pastor within the Assemblies of God that he had been involved in child sexual abuse. Yes. Now, I note in that, uh, in that letter that you don't mention the identity of either Pastor Frank or of AHA. That's right. And... Did anything happen as a result of this letter? Did you receive any reply from Pastor McMartin? I thought from memory that's how the meeting with Brian and 
John McMartin and myself occurred, I thought he followed that through from memory. Well, we have... There is a meeting that occurs um, somewhat later that year in November 1999, but we're not up to the September letter as yet. Oh. So I wanted to ask you about that period between May of 1999, when you write to Pastor McMartin, yes. and September 1999, yes. when you write again to Pastor McMartin. You, so you understand there are those two letters? Yes. yes. I, I was overseas in America for six weeks during that time. Um, did you receive any contact from Pastor McMartin during that time? No. Um, then, on the 16th of September 1999, you say in your statement at paragraph 20 that you spoke to Pastor McMartin. Is that right? 20. Yes, it'll come up on the screen now. Right. I'll just, if you can read that to yourself. Yes. Mm. That's correct. Thank you. Um, so where did that meeting take place? This is the meeting I can't remember. I, I don't remember. All right. Um, it never took place in my church, so I would assume it took place in his church. But I don't recall that meeting. Um, you, I'll take you to the letter that you wrote on the same day. Mm. And that'll come up. It's um, an extra H to your statement. And you'll see that the first paragraph says, I want to thank you for receiving me this morning to follow through with the matter concerning the alleged child abuse accusation by AHA. This incident occurred 30 years ago whilst Frank Houston was sharing his bedroom whilst here in ministry from New Zealand. Do you see that? I do. So is there any doubt in your mind that there was a meeting in the morning of the 16th of September 1999? No doubt. And uh, you're saying you just can't recall where that I, meeting took place? Uh, I would imagine it was at his church because I'd... Definitely wasn't at Emmanuel Church. And if we go down there, you indicate that Pastor McMartin indicated that there was um, a structure in place mm -hmm. for dealing with such allegations of child sexual abuse. Yes. And you said you would convey this to AHA and ask him if he wants to pursue the matter further. Is that right? Yes. And then you say, the second last paragraph, although Pastor Frank has rung AHA with great emotional appeal, the matter has only been exacerbated because... What came across to AHA was he was not sorry <coughs> for the damage he caused AHA, but only that it might be exposed. Correct. And that was based on conversations you'd had with AHA? Yes. Now, you also wrote on the same day to... Is that right? Yes, yeah, so if we just go back to yes. Annexia G in your statement, you'll see there's a letter dated the 16th of September 1999 mm -hmm. addressed to AHA. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. And he acknowledged yesterday that he received this letter. Yes. You assured him in that third paragraph, 
you told him about the meeting with Pastor John McMartin, mm -hmm. and then you assured him that should he feel able to take this matter to a conclusion, mm -hmm. that he would be fairly dealt with. Is that right? I felt that, yes. What did you mean by fairly dealt with? The church would give him some support and encourage him in a healing process. Um, Listen yeah. to his story, sorry. No, please, please finish your answer if you, if you have more. I to felt say. that they would listen to his story. I, uh, um, he wanted people to to know how hurt he was. So, to that extent, he did want to pursue the allegations, is that right? He did. I, I don't believe he wanted it made public, but I think he wanted the church to be like the Good Samaritan and pour in the oil and the wine to heal the wounds. So his concern was some form of public exposure or embarrassment, is yes. that right? Yes. But that there was a, an underlying... Sorry, you formed the opinion that there was an issue about the matter being addressed properly. Yes, I believe there was a cry. And that... Uh, for help. To your understanding, that meant that there'd be some response from the Assemblies of God. Yes. Including disciplinary action, if that was necessary. Yes. Um, what about some form of compensation from the Assemblies of God? I was asked that question. I felt that the Assemblies of God should pay for professional counselling yeah. for Brett. Um, I never discussed compensation. So did, did you have that opinion in September? If we go ahead to Annexure J to your statement. Um, you'll see there <coughs> appear to be evidence of two conversations, a note that you made about two conversations, one with AHA and one with his mother. Is that right? Yes. And I think the right way in which to read this, I may be wrong, is that if we go to the asterisk at the bottom first and says, his mother said he was so sick of the whole matter and so stressed, if anyone approached him, he would deny it. Wondering where that would have me, I rang him. Where that would leave me. Thank you. Wondering where that would leave me, I rank him. Does that... Is yes. that your handwriting? That's my handwriting. OK. So am I right in saying that you had a conversation with his mother first before... Yes. ..you rang AHA? Yes. And then you put that to him and then you record here in your note that he says, 
he never said he would deny the incident. Do you see he that? He did, yes. So at that stage, and as a, in that phone call, AHA said to you that he was thinking about going to the secular courts for compensation. Yes. And that he had had advice from a chamber magistrate who said charge him immediately. Yes. So to your understanding, he was considering going to the police. He was. And uh, do I take it that he was weighing up his options at that stage? Yes. He was very confused. Yes. Now, between September, that letter of the 16th of September and this note of the 25th of November, had you had any contact with uh, Pastor McMartin, for example? I think if I had, I would have made a record of it. Um, did you have any contact with... So I should complete that. So do I take that to mean that it's unlikely that it's you did have such contact? Yes. And did you have any contact with Pastor Brian Houston during that period? No. No. All right. Now, you mean regarding this matter, don't regarding you? Regarding this because, matter, that's correct. Yes. Because I probably would have seen him around at conferences or something like that. Yes, but I'm just talking about that period between when no. you write the letter in September, no. 16th of December, through to the 25th of November. No. If we go then to an extra K, it's uh, another note of a meeting held on the 28th of November 1999. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, this is a meeting that you had with Pastor Houston and Pastor McMartin. Yes. Where did that take place? Do you remember? Yes, I do. It, it took place at Pastor Brian Houston's office. At Hillsong? I don't think it was Hillsong then. CLC, I think. Thank you, but in the in the Hills District. Yes, in the in the Hills District. Um, now, how did this meeting come about? I think it was John McMartin who organised it, but I don't know. I I'm not privy to those details. John just asked me if I would go and meet with him and Brian to talk about it. Mm. All right. Um... And then, you, then it says, Frank Houston had confessed to a lesser incident than the truthful one, but it was further than I had been able to get. Do you see that? I do. So that confession, the confession of Frank Houston, is it a reference to a confession he gave to Pastor Brian Houston, to yourself or to somebody else? I assumed that he had confessed it to Brian. Brian was able to get a confession out of him. I, I was unsuccessful. Um, and what do you mean by a lesser incident? Well, I was told that, that AHA, as a little boy, had just walked through the room without his clothes on. Well, that wasn't what I was told. So that was the extent of the confession, was it? Well, I didn't hear the confession. Um, what did um, Pastor Brian Houston say to you about the confession? What did he say the confession had been? I think he just said he'd confessed. Um, and Frank said it was a one-off incident. Do you see that? Yes. So that was, I presume, communicated to you by, by Brian, Brian Houston. Houston. Correct. <clears throat> and at that stage, you did not believe that it was a one-off incident. Is that right? Well, I'd been getting information from my friend Cheryl Lewin who said these people just don't do one thing. There's always more than one. What about 
by that stage, you'd spoken to AHA quite a number of times. Yes. Had he indicated to you that there was more than one incident? No, I didn't actually talk to the lad, the man, as he was then, because it was of such a sensitive nature and he was so emotional about it. It was very difficult to talk about it. Um, now, at that meeting, did um, Brian Houston provide you with a note of, first of all, the allegations from AHA? No. Did he provide you with some form of note, a written note, about what the admission by Pastor Frank Houston had been? I was provided with nothing. Now, Brian Houston, you say that he and his family were in shock and that his father would be stood down from preaching. That's what I was told. And they would do it wisely. What does, what does that mean? I think we would have to ask them. I'm not sure. Did you form an opinion that they would handle it confidentially? Is, is that what that meant? Yes, I just trusted them to do it correctly. They're very influential people. I pastor a small church in Mount Druitt. And uh, so as far as you're concerned, that um, uh, Father... Sorry, I withdraw that. Um, you knew that Pastor Brian Houston was the, the president, the national president of the Assemblies of God at that stage? Yes. And even back in 1999, he was the leader of a very, a very large um, congregation at Hills Christian Life Centre. Yes, and a progressive one. It was growing all the time. Very successful. Now, you say here that um, you suggested that AHA should receive counselling. Yes. Organised and paid for by the AOG. Yes. Um, do you know whether that ever occurred? Only from yesterday that it never did occur. Um, do you recall seeing any letter to AHA or any advice from the AOG to him offering such counselling? No. I didn't ever see a letter. Do you recall there being any arrangement for um, a person unrelated to the allegations to assist AHA from... The uh, Assemblies of God? To my knowledge, there was no one. Was there any discussion at that meeting of uh, referring AHA to some form of sexual assault counselling, apart from what you've had here? Not in my presence. Um, was there any discussion... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. I'll take you to the next part. Now, you indicated to the meeting that AHA was intending to go to court. Is that right? Did I? Part point five. Oh, there was a possibility, yes. Um, and then Pastor Brian Houston said he had spoken to a barrister who had told him that if it goes to court his father would surely be incarcerated for the crime. Do you see that? I do. So did, was um, Brian Houston worried about that fact? I honestly don't know if he was. Did he say anything more about um, the matter going to the police? No, I did not. Did he say anything about... Um, AHA being given some form of independent advice about his rights? I did not say anything. I left it to them. Yes, did they say anything about... No. ..about that? Go on to an extra L. 
see this is um, a letter that you wrote to Pastor Brian Houston on the 29th of November 1999 and you passed on the admission by um, by Frank Houston to Pastor Brian Houston. Is that right? Uh, passed on the admission. If you please go to the fourth paragraph of that letter. When I rang AHA on oh, Saturday yes, morning. Oh yes, yes. Could you please ask the question again? I will. Um, so I take it that um, you then, the next day or so, spoke to AHA and told him about the uh, meeting that you'd had with Brian Houston and John McMartin, is that right? Yes. Um, and you say in the letter to Pastor Brian Houston that AHA said he was in absolute shock that your dad had actually not denied the incident. Yes. So, do I take it from that that you had said to AHA that as a result of the meeting you just had with, with Pastor Houston and John McMartin, mm -hmm. that Pastor Frank had not denied the incident? Yes. And now, you say that um, earlier in, I think it was about May of 1999, there'd been a conversation between the two of them, between Frank Houston and, between, and AHA, where Frank Houston had broken down and cried. Yes. And so forth. Why do you think there was an absolute shock? And what was he trying to contact him about? I don't know, actually. Was it about the uh, was it about the the admission? Could have been, possibly. All don't right. Know. Did you form an opinion at about this time? That is, uh, in late November nineteen ninety nine, that the person handling the allegations was Brian Houston. Um, I don't think I'd really thought that through. But I expected that the executive would handle it. And when you say the executive, you mean the uh, national executive? The national executive. And is that why you wrote to Brian Houston rather than John McMartin on the 29th of November? Yes. And you see there's a final note there, 2nd of December. John Wolfenden asked me re-credential addendum, told him the matter was being resolved and to ring John McMartin. Do you see that? Yes. And that's a reference to you providing earlier in an extra I, some indication to Mr Wolfenden um, 
indication that there were, that you were dealing with a with an abuse allegation. Is that right? Yes, correct. Right, and then if we go back to the handwritten note for the second of November, second of December, nineteen ninety nine told Mr Wolfen that the matter was being resolved and to ring John McMartin. Is yes. That right? So there was, to the degree that there was a process, it was being handled firstly by Pastor Brian Houston with the assistance of John McMartin. Yes, it had firstly been taken to John McMartin who took it to Brian Houston. All right, so John McMartin's at the State Executive and yes. Brian Houston at the National yes. Executive. Um, a document dated the 21st of December 1999 notes to speak to John McMartin when I spoke to him. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, are you able to clarify what that means? Does that mean these notes were prepared before you spoke to John McMartin or were they prepared after you spoke to John McMartin? I can't remember. So if we go to point two there, you in, at least intended to say to John McMartin on about the 21st of December that Brian had made phone contact. we have, um, did he hear, so he I presume refers to Mick Martin, Brian say he would stand his father down, if so, how long? Is that right? Yes. So do I take it that by the 21st of December you had not heard whether uh, Frank Houston was to be stood down or not? Correct. Um, and you were wondering where you were to go from here, what, what you could do to assist AHA? Yes. Um, so by this stage, had you had any conversation with either AHA or Pastor Brian Houston about the payment of compensation to AHA? I never had any conversation about any compensation whatsoever. Was it ever mentioned to you by Pastor Brian Houston that an agreement had been made to pay... Um, AHA either ten or twelve thousand dollars in time? Never, never. When was the first time you heard about that payment? Yesterday. And then you wrote to, sorry, I withdraw that. Um, were you aware that there was a, um, a special executive meeting of the um, National Executive of the Assemblies of God on the 22nd of December, 1999? No. I wouldn't be told. <laughs> were, you, were you ever told that, that Pastor Frank Hewson had in fact been suspended by... Um, his son, 
I was never told. No. Uh, were you told that the suspension had been approved by the National Executive no. on the 22nd of December 1999? No. Did you later become aware that he'd been suspended? I heard through the grapevine. There was no formal announcement of his suspension, is that right? Not to me. Um, we have a letter from you to Pastor Brian Houston of the 26th of June 2000. You say the, the second paragraph, I refer to the unfinished matter with your father, Frank Houston. Is he receiving counselling for his undealt with problem? Question mark. I think not, for I have heard from people with knowledge of the problem that a week after you said you were going to discipline him by standing him down, that he was preaching and prophesying over people at Canberra. The same people pointed out to me that his name is on the Hillsong brochure. Another person with knowledge of the situation came and told me he is preaching on TV in the mornings. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, by June 2000, had there been any communication with you um, that Father Frank had been suspended? No. I wouldn't have written a letter had I known it was had been dealt with. And you were concerned in that letter that um, it appeared that he had just continued on as normal preaching yes. and so forth? Yes. That was my concern. That was information that you'd received from other people? Yes. You hadn't seen him preach yourself? At that I time. had not. And then you set out um, a, a note of a phone conversation that, that Pastor Brian Houston had with you. Um, and the note is dated 19th of July 2000. Is that right? That's correct. And was this a phone call you received in response to your letter? It was. Uh, and I mean the letter of the 26th of June 2000? Yes. And he told you that um, the father was, being, was receiving restoration counselling? Yes. Uh, that there'd been a meeting with... Uh, AHA and Pastor Frank Houston with an elder of CLC present? Yes. Do you say anything more about that meeting, what was discussed? No. He said he was very hurt by your letter. Do you see that? Yes. Did he say why he was hurt? Well, he said he dealt with the matter. I hadn't been told. Had I been told he'd dealt with it, I wouldn't have written the letter. But I thought things were just going on as normal and I didn't think that was proper. And then he goes on... Then you go on to say that any future correspondence to be by phone. Do you see that? Yeah, I do. Why, why... Do you understand why that was said to you? No. But that was something that he communicated to you about um, any further communication would be by phone. I remember saying to him, it's very difficult to get to you on the phone. And he said he would leave word with his secretary to put me straight through. To was that the the last um, involvement you had um, with with AHA concerning this matter? Yes. These allegations. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, and as far as you're aware, by certainly by June of two thousand. Um, you had been told by Brian Houston that the matter had effectively been dealt with by him. 
I felt the matter had been completely taken out of my hands, even by AHA, that possibly he wanted to handle it now himself. Right, and the, you didn't consider that there was, a, there was further room for your involvement in the matter? I felt I'd been excluded at that point. Um, are you aware that later in 2000 more allegations came of sexual abuse by Frank Houston of children in New Zealand some 30 years ago? I heard a whisper, but nothing official. Right. Were you told that the national executive had, had uh, met and considered the matter and determined that Frank Houston would not... Um, further preach at all um, if those new allegations were admitted? I wasn't told anything. Did you later receive a copy of a letter that was sent to... Tender bundle, the Hillsong tender bundle could come up, please. through that letter, it'll scroll down. You'll see at the bottom, Frank Houston's name is mentioned. If you could scroll down to that, please. If we go over the page, please. Mm -hmm. No recollection of ever receiving that letter. Have you read that now? I have read it. Is that a document you've seen before? Not. I have no recollection of ever seeing that document before. All right. So if I, we just um, scroll back to the first page, you'll see it's, although this copy is addressed to Pastor Brian Houston, it's also addressed to all ordained and probationary ministers of the Assemblies of God in Australia. Do you see that? Yes, I did notice that. Do you think that. it's... it's, it's Possible, perhaps even likely, that you received a copy of this letter about uh, December 2001? I have no recollection of ever receiving a letter All right. like that. Um, I just have 
one matter that um, I'm told I should have raised with you. It's a, if we could go back to Annexure K, and I'm sorry to do this out of order. So we're back at the meeting between you and Pastor Brian Houston and <coughs> John McMartin on the 28th of November, yes. 1999. And if you could just go to point five. <coughs> the time. Yes. I wonder if that's an appropriate place. You're probably ready for a short break in any event, um, Pastor you. Taylor. So we'll take the mid-morning break now. And I, I think you were in court yesterday, um, in the hearing room yesterday and you would have seen the process. So um, when we resume, I'll then um, call upon any other members from the bar table if they have questions for you, and I'm sure they will. Thank you. So we'll take the mid-morning break now.
back into the witness box. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, those are my questions. There may be other council who have questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. Beckett. Pastor Taylor. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Pastor Taylor, my name is Ms. McGlinchey and I represent AHA in these proceedings. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please let me know if you can't at any stage. Could we... Uh, uh, would Tab two and that should K be brought up, please. Tab two. Pastor Taylor, do you have that document in front of you? I do. Right. Now, you've already been asked some questions about this document this morning, and I'll try not to go over the same ground. Uh, this is your record of... This is your summary of the meeting with Brian Houston and John McMartin on the 28th of November, 1999. Yes. Right. I just want to clarify some of the points and who uh, who said what at the meeting. Okay, so if you could um, give me some assistance on that. Uh, your first point is that Frank Houston had confessed to a lesser incident than the truthful one, but it was further than I was able to get. Am I correct in assuming that you were told at that meeting that Frank Houston had confessed to a lesser incident? Yes. And you were told by? Brian Houston. And the second part of that, and I'll read it out, uh, but it was further than I was able to get. Is that your comment? That's my comment, because I couldn't get a confession out of Frank Houston Thank you. at all. Point two, Frank said that it was a one-off incident... Were you t was that said at the meeting? That was said at the meeting, Who yes. Who said that? Uh, Brian Houston. And the second part, in brackets, which I did not and do not believe, is that your comment or was that said at the meeting? Uh, that was my comment. Now, th this morning you were asked some questions about that meeting and about conversation that might have taken place at the meeting about the one-off incident and the confession to a lesser incident. And you said uh, in your evidence this morning, well, I was told that AHA, as a little boy, had just walked through the room without his clothes on. Correct. Was that said at the meeting? It was. Who said that? Brian. And how was that relevant to the discussion about the, the incident or the confession? Well, that's supposed to have been all that happened. So, were you told that that was all the incident was entirely made up of AHA walking through a room without his clothes on as a little boy? It, it was a comment that Brian made in passing. We didn't actually discuss the incident or uh, what AHA had said or anything like that. Did you ask Brian Houston no. anything about that comment? No. Did you get the impression, and I'm only asking you for your impression, that it was being suggested that walking through the room without his clothes on somehow provoked the incident? I didn't take it that way. Right. How did you take it? I took it that he was trying to trivialise the incident and didn't want to... I didn't particularly want to talk about it. Right. Uh, okay. 
And when you say he, you mean Brian Houston? Brian it? Houston. Mm. I felt that his father had possibly trivialised the incident to Brian. <coughs> so it's not suggested that there was no actual sexual assault? That wasn't discussed. Thank you. I want to take you back to the beginning uh, of the progress of these matters and ask you some questions about the occasion when you and Pastor Mudford attended AHA's house. Yes. Right. And I think you've said that Pastor Mudford arrived earlier and you arrived some short time later. Yes. Is that because you went in different cars or...? I think we were in different cars, but I'm not sure. All right. Okay. I know I followed soon after him into the house. Sorry, I just need to adjust the microphone. <coughs> When you've described that meeting this this morning in your evidence, you said that there was a lot of shouting. Yes. Who was doing the shouting? Kevin was shouting and uh, AHA shouted in response. He was uh, devastated by the fact that his mother had told Kevin Mudford. What, do you recall what um, were the things that Kevin was shouting? He was shouting that Frank Houston should be stood down and dealt with straight away. Right. Okay. Anything else? Well, he surely wasn't just shouting that over and over again. Was there other things that he was shouting? Oh, probably there were, but I don't remember. It was such a, a volatile atmosphere. Yes. I felt if Kevin hadn't withdrawn quickly, there could have been an exchange of blows. But just to be clear, was there any preliminaries to set up this meeting? Did, was AHA asked if he wanted to have the meeting? He was never asked. I think it was his mother's idea, but even that I can't be sure about. So is it correct that AHA had no notice of this meeting? Kevin Mudford just arrived? I think that's what happened. Right. And thereafter, a shouting match and yeah. Kevin Mudford withdrew and then you withdrew as well? Yes. I stayed for a little while, but not too long. Would you agree that AHA was very upset about the meeting? Extremely upset. Distressed? Distressed is correct. <coughs> Pastor Taylor, could I just ask you to open up your statement at paragraph 7? Could that come up on the screen, please? Could I just ask you to read that paragraph to yourself? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. You said in that uh, paragraph 7, AHI told me that when Frank stayed at their home... When AHA was seven years old, Frank had shared a room with AHA and touched AHA, I think it's meant to be AHA, inappropriately. Right. That's what I was told. Who were you told that by, though? Was it AHI or somebody else? His mother. All right. So the, the part of that that I'm referring to is the suggestion that Frank Houston shared a bedroom with AHA. That's how I was told that there was a sharing of a room. Right. And you were told that by AHI? No, by his mother. Oh, AHI. She's that's the pseudonym that's been Oh, used. I'm sorry, I'm right. sorry. Hmm. Could you be mistaken that a about that, that AHI told you that? Uh, the, mother, the mother told me. I ask you some questions about your the meeting you had with uh, Pastor McMartin 
and Kevin Mudford on the 4th of November 1998. That's the first meeting yes. that you had with Pastor McMartin. Mm -hmm. Did you um, say in your statement that your understanding at the time, that's paragraph 11 of your statement. Can that please come up on the screen? This is paragraph 11. A paragraph 11? Yes. And the <coughs> sentence that I want to refer you to is that my understanding at the time was that it was AOGA protocol to report allegations against ministers to the state executive. Correct. Is that what you were doing when you met with, um, had that meeting on the 4th of November? How it happened was... Uh, Kevin Mudford came to me and asked me to go with him to John, Pastor John McMartin, who was his pastor and also a member of the state executive. Uh, he wanted to talk to him about what had been said and wanted his advice. Was it your understanding that by having that meeting you were following the protocol and reporting the incident? Actually, it wasn't strictly the protocol. I should have gone to the Sydney district, but Kevin was quite upset with Frank Houston and he wanted something done immediately. And he asked me to go with him to his pastor to report it, so I went. As I understand your evidence and uh, your statement, the name of the perpetrator was not mentioned at that meeting. Correct. Why was that? Because we only had one incident with one man, and this was a high flyer in the Assemblies of God. And I'd, I suppose in hindsight it was a fear. Your fear? Probably my fear. I was trying to restrain Kevin. Restrain him in what way? Well, he wanted to blow it out of the water straight away. When you say that, do you mean that he wanted to mention Frank Houston's name at that meeting? He wanted Frank Houston immediately dealt with. Well, why, uh, and you may not know this, but why did he not mention Frank Houston's name at that meeting? Why didn't I? No, why didn't you? And I said, you may not know this. Was there a conversation between you and Pastor Mudford about whether Frank Houston would be named at that meeting? I said I thought it's better we don't name Frank Houston. You told that to Pastor Mudford? Yes. I'm amazed that he took notice, actually. But we were both in the same boat, really, because this is a very... A man highly respected, highly regarded, not only in Australia but overseas. I'd been in Indonesia uh, at a place called Tawamangu in a Bible school and he was held in the highest regard. And here am I from a small church coming to make such an allegation about one incident about with a young man who was vacillating one day he's going to go ahead with and the next day he's not. I felt I was between a rock and a hard place. Just remembering back that conversation with um, Pastor McMartin, did he press you for the name at all? Did he ask for the name of the minister? No. Did he ask you <coughs> any questions such as whether the minister was a serving minister? No. He didn't ask you any questions at all? No. Was there any consideration at all about whether the minister may stay, still be in a position to assault children? Not to my knowledge. It was never discussed. Oh. Do you agree that not very much could have happened after that meeting without Pastor McMartin knowing any details? I think that's a fair comment, yes. Except he could have pressed... To know. Certainly. Did you expect that he would? No. I find most people don't want to hear about these things. Were you given any guidance by Pastor McMartin as to how you could proceed? 
I think from uh, the statement, I said he told us to go to Brian Houston. I think that was in the second, may have been in the second meeting. Mm. In the first meeting, were you given any guidance at all? No. Uh, do you recall that uh, Pastor McMartin told you that you should be led by the Lord in the way you handle it? Yes. And that was helpful to you or not? It wasn't helpful at all. You said in uh, paragraph 15 that the investigation proceeded at a slow pace. Now, when you say investigation, what do you actually mean? What was the process that was happening at that time? In hindsight, I think it was zilch. Right. I was pushing for something. What were you pushing for? Did he ask you to organise a meeting with AHA or did he express to you that he wanted uh, uh, Frank Houston, you know, brought to some sort of disciplinary proceedings or both? What's your recollection? I don't recall ever discussing with AHA what should happen to Frank Houston. Did you believe that they should meet? Yes. Why? Because... It seemed to be important to AHA at that time to, for this man to acknowledge it because one of the things these people sometimes think that no one, they've imagined it and they, they get confused. Was it important to you as a minister to bring the perpetrator and the victim Absolutely. Together? That would have given me proof to go to somebody and say, look, this man has confessed to this. Would it, was it important to you in a spiritual sense? Did you hope that the meeting would achieve some sort of... Reconciliation, yes. Yes. During that time, AHA was very distraught whenever you spoke to him. Is that a fair... Is that yes. a fair summary? It was difficult to talk to him about the... the Incident because of his distressed uh, reaction. I was reluctant to open the subject. He was in a very emotional, vulnerable state. Extremely. Had you ever had any um, dealings with this kind of matter before, uh, a sexual assault of a child? Not in a particular way, no. All right. Can I suggest to you that AHA did not seek a meeting with Frank Houston. Can you... What do you say to that? I thought he had one. He organised himself. Perhaps I should be clearer. I want to suggest to you that AHA did not ask you to organise a meeting with Frank Houston and himself. I, I can't give you an answer there. Can I suggest to you that it was your belief that the two should meet? 
for spiritual reasons and that you attempted to bring that meeting together. I thought he wanted to meet with him. <clears throat> Did you give any consideration in that time to AHA's mental health? I thought I did. Did you suggest that he see a doctor? No. Do you, did you suggest to him that he might seek assistance other than to speak to you? It's very difficult to tell someone to seek advice that doesn't want to talk about the problem. Well, he wanted to keep it close. So is the answer no to that? No. In that period when you were talking to AHA and trying to organise the meeting with um, Frank Houston, uh, you've already given evidence that there was some uh, suggestion by AHA that he might seek uh, a le legal avenues, is that correct? Yes. You've given evidence today that your belief is that uh, in a matter such as this, the appropriate way is to go first to the church. Yes. And if the church doesn't resolve it, then go to the secular courts. Yes. Do you say that you ever suggested to Brett, sorry, I'm sorry, to AHA, that the secular courts would be an option for him? Yes, I said that if the church refused to deal with the matter, he, he would go to the secular courts, yes. Do you, do you say that you said that directly to AHA? I can't remember if I said it directly or not. Can I suggest that you never suggested to AHA that at any stage secular courts may be uh, an option for him? <clears throat> Is that possible? That you didn't have that conversation with him? I don't know. I, you're asking me to remember things from 16 years ago, uh, details of which um, I want to be sure what I say here is the absolute truth. I, I do appreciate that. You have been, um, just jumping forward in the chronology, you sent a letter to Brian Houston and uh, then some period after that he called you and you had a conversation on the phone. Yes. Do you recall that? Um, one of the things that Brian Houston told you on the, on the phone was that AHA had met with Frank Houston and uh, an elder of the church. Is that correct? Do you recall that? Without the document being brought up? Yes, I do recall that. And, and you, you see, he did have a meeting with Frank Houston. Yes. Without I'm, me. I'm just, yes, I, I'm not denying that at all. I just want to focus your mind on what uh, Brian Houston may have told you about that meeting. Do you recall anything at all that he told you about? I take it that Brian Houston was the one who communicated to you that Frank Houston had met with AHA and an elder of the church? Uh, I object to... Uh, I think this is, I'm, I'm slightly confused, and I yes, just wonder I whether too. the witness is as well. Is this a reference to the meeting recorded in the document Annexure K of the 28th of November 1999? Perhaps uh, Ms McGlinchey could clarify whether it's that meeting or some other meeting or some other communication. Uh, an extra K could come up on the screen. I'm sorry, Your Honour, if I might just find the document.
might just leave that point, um, Your Honour, I'm not able to find that document. I don't have anything further. Thank you. Do you want to go last? Mr. If I could, Your Honour, yes. thank you. Mr Higgins. Thank you, Your Honour. I'm Pastor Taylor. My name's Higgins. I'm asking questions on behalf of Hillsong and Brian Houston. Um, a moment ago, you're... Sorry, can you hear me OK? I can. A moment ago, you were asked some questions by counsel for AHA about some evidence you'd given earlier in response to a question from counsel assisting about the confession um, that was relayed to you by Brian Houston at the meeting of the 28th of November 1999. Do you remember the point at time I'm referring to? Can that letter come up, please? Yes. Certainly. Um, so it's an extra K. Okay. It's not the document you're referring to, is it? No, it's not. It is. Sorry. <coughs> this is the one. Um, you're asked, can I suggest this to you? When you were being asked questions by counsel assisting before the morning tea break, you were being asked about this document. Agreed? Yes. Okay. You were taken to um, paragraph one. And you're being asked about your entry of a confession by Frank Houston to a lesser incident. Remember that? Yes. And then after the morning tea break, counsel for AHA suggested to you that the answer that you gave um, was, for the benefit of Your Honour, Commissioner and my friend, I'm referencing page 9158, lines 40 to 43. What was suggested to you by counsel for AHA that your answer was, is that I was told that AHA as a little boy had just walked through the room without his clothes on, full stop, end quote. Do you remember when that suggestion was put to you by counsel for AHA, just after the morning tea break. Yes. And your answer was that you thought, uh, sorry, you felt that Frank Houston had trivialised the incident to Brian Houston. That's my thoughts. OK. I wasn't there. What, what I want to suggest to you is that what was suggested to you as your answer wasn't the complete answer that you gave. In fact, the complete answer that you gave was... Well, I was told that AHA, as a little boy, had just walked through the room without his clothes on. Well, that wasn't what I was told, full stop, end quote. Can I suggest that was the answer that you gave to counsel assisting? But that, oh, sorry, I don't understand right. what you're saying. Way. Mr Higgins, you're reading from the transcript. I, am, um, I, I wonder if I could ask it this way, if I may, Your Honour. Try again. Would you accept from me that that's what you told counsel assisting, that you were not told that AHA as a little boy had walked through, make sure I get it right, had walked through the room without his clothes on. I object to that. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I do is because when a friend prefaces the question, it's just objection as to form. Yep. You were not told. Yes. By the who? answer that operates on by who. Yes. Um, can I suggest this to you, Pastor Taylor? You were not told by Brian Houston at that meeting of the 28th of November that... The lesser incident was AHA walking through the room without his clothes on. 
That was said at that meeting, that's all I know. And no further discussion was ended into as to what actually did happen. I did not say what the mother of AHA had told me at that meeting. When you said to council assisting, uh, well, that wasn't what I was told, what did you mean by that? Because the mother had told me a different story. I understand. Um, and perhaps more importantly, Mr Higgins, that's what I'd understood the answer to. please. When you say that you felt that it was being trivialised, did you mean by that, not that Brian was trivialising it, but that Frank had trivialised it to Brian? I can only express an opinion, yep. and that was that Frank had trivialised it to his son. All right. That's only my opinion. I wasn't there. Can I, can I move backwards in time to November 98, and particularly uh, the 4th of November 98, which was the meeting between uh, you and Mr Mudford and Mr McMartin? Could that come up on the screen, please? I'm continuing for uh, tab A. <clears throat> so just by reference to your entry there for the 4th of November 98. Yes. Um, do you understand the meeting I'm referring to? Yes. On the 4th of November 98, when you and Mr Mudford met with Mr McMartin, um, one of the matters, one of the things you told council assisting was that you assumed, following that meeting, that Mr McMartin would have done something further. This is 9144.29 and following. Yes. Um, would you agree that what was known to Mr McMartin as at the 4th of November 98 was that it was a, an allegation of, uh, or was it an allegation of sex or just an allegation of abuse? Well, I object, I object to that question in those terms. What was known to McMartin, if my friend is referencing what was known to McMartin out of this meeting, there'd be no objection. Mm -hmm. um, as a consequence of this meeting, um, was it known to Mr McMartin that it was an allegation of sexual abuse? Yes. By a senior uh, minister or, or member of the congregation? Of the church? Of the church, yes. Thanks. And against a, mi a, a person who was a minor at the time? Yes. But was no longer a minor? Correct. But the identity was not of the perpetrator was not known. Wasn't revealed to the him. Yep, thank you. The identity of the victim wasn't revealed. To John McMartin, correct. All right. What was suggested, if anything, by you to Mr McMartin should be done? I thought the matter should be looked into. Okay. What did you envisage would happen without the identity of the perpetrator and the victim being made or being revealed? That some follow-up would have occurred at least to provide some kind of counselling for the victim because I could have given him the name of the victim. All right. But you could... You could have done that as at the 4th of November 98, couldn't you? I could have. But you were being sensitive to the wishes of AHA at that time? Very much. And, and was that instructive to you about why you did not choose to reveal the identity of the victim? That was part of it. All right. Um, 
Why not then reveal the identity of the perpetrator? Because he was a high flyer in the Assemblies of God and this was a one-off incident and I didn't feel we had enough evidence to pursue the matter without facing maybe a libel case. So then returning to my question a moment ago to you, um, you had some concerns about... Uh, which right, did you have some concerns about the truthfulness of the allegation at that time? No, I believed it. So what then did you think could be done by Mr McMartin without knowing the identity of the perpetrator or the identity of the victim? It wasn't my idea in the first place to go to Mr McMartin. My idea would have been to go to Ian Woods, who was the Sydney district leader. I went with, um, uh, with Kevin because he asked me to go as a witness to the fact that he was revealing. I do admit it was hard for John McMartin to do anything except to have given us some advice about what to do, which was not given. Was there any suggestion by Mr McMartin, or withdraw that, did Mr McMartin tell you at this meeting that uh, he really needed some form of uh, written complaint by the victim in order for it to go further? I think at the subsequent meeting he mentioned that, but he didn't at that meeting. Did Mr Mudford at that meeting suggest what he expected would happen without the identity of the perpetrator or the victim being revealed? No, he didn't. I think he just wanted to unburden uh, what had been dumped on him. Um, so earlier in answer to questions from counsel assisting when you were asked why did you decide not to go to Brian Houston about the allegation? And you answered that it was his father, he was loved by Eddie, everybody and there was only one case to go on. <laughs> Would it, was it also relevant why in November 98 you and others chose not to go to Brian Houston is because you did not wish to reveal the identity, firstly, of the perpetrator. Which letter are we talking about now? I'm still talking about the meeting of the 4th of November, 98, that you and uh, the evangelist Mudford yes. had with John McMartin. And the question is? You explained to counsel assisting earlier that the reason it was decided not to go to Brian Houston at that time, November 98, was because it was Brian's father, it was a one-off case to go on, Yes. and that Frank Houston was loved by everybody. Yes, and I was afraid that... Uh if we didn't have enough proof and there was some kind of litigation, that Kevin and I would be in a bad position of, of libel. OK, I understand you're worried about accountability. Can I suggest this, uh, Pastor? You did not wish to reveal the identity of the perpetrator at that stage because you were concerned for your own accountability? Incorrect. All right. Okay. Um, you did not wish to reveal the identity of the perpetrator at that stage? Is that the question? That, that's, yes, Your Honour. That's true. I didn't want to reveal the identity. It all happened so quickly. One night, there's, uh, the mother reveals this. The, the young man's in a, a, a 
traumatic state of mind. Uh, Kevin is all so pumped up and everybody seemed to be very emotional and very stirred up. And because of the sensitivity of you towards AHA's wishes, you didn't wish to take it to Brian Houston. I didn't think that that was the way it should go. It should go through the state executive, not through state to Brian Houston. Can I, same day but a different meeting, can I move to the meeting um, that you were present at between the evangelist Mudford and AHA? Do you right. Re do you remember which meeting I'm speaking about? Yes, I do. And... <clears throat> Is it the case that the anger on the part of Mudford was not directed towards AHA, but rather about his anger at the behaviour of Frank Houston towards Correct. AHA? Correct. Um, is it a fair characterisation of the evangelist Mudford that he he has what could describe as an excitable character or an excitable nature. Very. Is he a bit of a fire and brimstone type person? I don't know what you mean by that. But fair enough. Um, is he um, someone who is uh, quick to anger or quick to emotion? Yes. He, he comes across as excitable. Yes. He's an evangelist. Through that. And that's how he relates to people. Yes. Right. It can be interpreted as anger. Could it be interpreted as anger? I think it's anger. It was in this case anger. Right. But not directed at AHA. No. That question's been put and answered three times now, Mr. John, Kings. please. Can I move then? to the period between November 98 and May of 99, is it fair to say that, as you've told us, you were attempting to have Frank Houston meet with AHA because that's what AHA wanted? I really thought that, yes. I'm amazed to find out he didn't. And by the time the 19th of May 99 came around, was there a degree of frustration on your part about the inability for that to occur? I was uh, frustrated about the whole saga. Can an extra F from tab two be brought up on the screen, please? <clears throat> This is the transcript of your letter of the 19th of May, 99, um, that you wrote to Mr McMartin. Yes. Um, is it the case that one of the reasons you came to write this letter is that having approached Mr McMartin, back in November 98, mm -hmm. you had embarked upon a process of trying to get Frank Houston to meet with AHA without success, and you were raising this with Mr McMartin. Yes. And that... <coughs> You've told counsel assisting that you still decided at this stage not to reveal the identity of the perpetrator. Agreed? Yes. Or the identity of the victim. Do you agree with that? It would appear that way, yes. Whatever I wrote in that letter is right. What, what did you anticipate would be done, if anything, by Mr McMartin 
when he received this letter from you in May 99? What was your expectation? That he would follow it through. And how did you expect him to do that without the identity of the perpetrator or the victim? Well, he, he could have approached me privately and asked me more. And I could have had a confidence, perhaps, I would have been listened to. And until I had that confidence, I didn't feel free to divulge any names. But if you were prepared to write to him, I'm assuming, in confidence, why wouldn't you have disclosed it in that same confidence? Because the pen is mightier than the sword. All right, so why then not ring him? A good question. I don't know. Moving on. But in the period between May 99 and 16 September 99, what, if anything, happened to change your mind? I think... Oh, I don't know. I'm not going to express my thoughts because I don't know. Can Annette H be brought to the screen, please? So, do you have on the screen your letter to Mr McMartin of the 16th I do. I do. And you agree that uh, this follows your meeting with him? Yes. And at that meeting, it was the... Was it the first disclosure by you of AHA's identity? To, to John McMartin, it yes. would certainly appear that way. And it was the first disclosure by you of the perpetrators being Frank Houston to John yes. McMartin? Yes. Do you know why it is you chose that date to have that meeting with oh, him? I have no idea why you chose that day. Do you know why you chose that date to reveal mm -hmm. AHAs? I have no idea. Um, okay. <clears throat> and... When, after that meeting, did, is it fair to say that you were comforted to some extent as a result of the meeting because Mr McMartin told you that a procedure existed within the assembly of, Assemblies of God to deal with these types of allegations? It was a comfort, yes. And that there was an expectation by you, having revealed the identity of the victim and the identity of the perpetrator, um, that now a structured process could begin to resolve the problem. Yes. Within the church. Yes. That was your expectation. Yes. Um, Right. Is, it, is it fair to say that between the writing of that letter on the 16th of September and the 25th of November when you met with AHA that you'd had no meetings, no further meetings with John McMartin? Uh, what's the meeting with AHA? I can't see that here. Um, can some bring up an extra J for Juliet? I think this that question, in fact, has been asked and answered earlier on. Yeah. Asked yeah. It, which is why I didn't feel the need to bring the document up. But I have this evening spoken. Can I suggest It doesn't you... say it was a meeting. All right. Um, I'm, st I'm happy to be corrected. On the 25th of November, you spoke to AHA and he yes. told you certain things. Mm -hmm. And I think you've told council assisting earlier that between the 16th of September 99, when you, you met with Mr McMartin, and the 25th of November 99, when you spoke to AHA, you'd had no, no other meetings with Mr McMartin. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I don't recall any other meeting. I mean, 
whatever's in my letters, that's what I had. All right. There's just a there's a gap between the 16th of September '99 and the 25th of November '99. I'm just trying to determine uh, if is it correct that there were no other meetings with Mr. McMartin in that time. <coughs> I don't believe there was any other meetings until he asked me to go and meet with uh, Brian and himself. And the meeting with Brian and himself, that was the one on the 28th of November. Can that letter come up, please? It's an extra K, please. Yes. And does that refresh your memory? Yes, I certainly remember that meeting, sir. Okay. Now, at that meeting, did you get the impression that this was the occasion uh, I'll draw that. <coughs> One of the things you've told Council Assisting earlier is that Brian told you that Frank had confessed to something. Agreed? Agreed. Did you conclude from that that Brian already knew about the allegation before this meeting of the 28th of November? Well, I assumed it because his father wasn't there yeah. and he, he had some information that his father had confessed to something. Whatever he confessed, I don't know. <coughs> so if Mr McMartin tells us that he was the the person who first told Brian Houston. Um, I object to that. I'm not sure that's, uh, that's borne out by the evidence. No, I'm just checking that myself. Um, the evidence, paragraph 64, sorry, 56 to 59 of... of This is of um, Mr McMartin's statement yes, are you correct. referring to? Correct. <coughs> so perhaps if you can um, put, put, the question. put the question again, please, Thank to you. Pastor Taylor. Pastor Taylor, can I suggest this to you? that when you went to that... I'll put it another way, if I may, Ron. When you went to that meeting on the 28th of November 99, did John McMartin think he was telling Brian Houston something for the first time? I object. <laughs> I have no idea. Just stop while we deal it's with the objection. Form. If it says to form, I'm happy to rephrase it. Yes, thank you. That's right. Did Mr McMartin tell you anything to suggest that he was going to reveal the allegation to Brian for the first time? He said nothing about that. Right. Did he suggest to you that the purpose of this meeting was to inform Brian about the allegation? I thought it was to take some action for resolving it. And was the way in which the action be taken to resolve it was to inform Brian of the identity of the perpetrator and the victim. Well, I object to that. I don't I really, know. I don't think this flows I at all no from idea. the... Oops, sorry, Pastor Taylor. Uh, I don't think that oops, follows at all from the meeting on the 28th of November 1999. It also seems to be contrary to Mr Houston's... Uh, sorry, Pastor Houston's... Statement. Statement as well. Look, I agree with that, but what I'm attempting to deal with is what's asserted at paragraphs 56 to 59 of tab 6, a different uh, account of who was the first person to inform Yes, but it, I don't know. Mr who. Higgins, I think really what you can do with Pastor Taylor is very limited. That's a matter you need to take up with Mr McMartin. Oh, I, I intend to. I, yeah. I guess what I was seeking to explore is that given that this witness was with Pastor Pastor McMartin at that meeting, does this witness able to assist the inquiry as to what 
Pastor McMartin had told her was the purpose of the meeting? And that's the point of the question. Well, I understood Pastor Taylor had already answered what um, she thought was the purpose of the meeting. But you're, you're, you're after a separate issue, aren't you? Not the purpose of the meeting, right. but whether or not um, this, the uh, revelation of the identity was um, being done for the first time. That, that's certainly the issue that I'm going to, and that I'm submitting that the per one of the purposes of this meeting could well be the disclosure for the first time. Well, why as don't a... you put that directly to Pastor Taylor? Oh, I thought it had, but I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Your Honour. Look, was one of the purposes of this meeting was to tell Brian Houston for the first time the identity of the perpetrator and the uh, victim. Well, I object to that because <coughs> that seems contradictory to the paragraphs that my friend relies on for this line of questioning, and specifically the effect of paragraph 54, the first sentence, and paragraph 57 taken together. It's clear from the history that's set out in narrative form in those paragraphs that, that there was some intervening meeting with a pastor or corn in which Pastor Houston obtained certain advice. There was then further delay uh, possibly up to two weeks, I'm reading now from paragraph 56, until Pastor Brian Houston uh, got in contact, and that was when the <coughs> allegation was relayed. That's not a fair reading of 55. <coughs> and and rather, than, rather than do it that way, Mr Kernigan, I'm content with Pastor Taylor being asked whether or not um, she understood the purpose of the, meaning, uh, of the meeting to be uh, to reveal for the first time the identity of the perpetrator. Um, I'm sure Pastor Taylor will uh, please, do her best to answer that question. Mm. Pastor, do you need the question again? I do. All right. Um, did Pastor McMartin tell you that the, pur the purpose of the meeting was to inform Brian Houston for the first time the identity of the perpetrator and the victim? No. Um, When Pastor, uh, when Brian Houston informed you and Pastor McMartin at that meeting that his father had confessed to him, did Mr McMartin say anything in your presence to suggest that he did not know that, past, that Brian Houston already knew? I don't remember. I ask that an extra K be brought up on the screen, please. Right. I beg your pardon, it's the previous one. I'm sorry. It's J. Just briefly, in relation to this, at the beginning of that month you'd lodged a document for the renewal of your credentials as a pastor. Yes. And uh, as part of that renewal you'd uh, annexed uh, a letter by yourself saying, look, th there was one matter which was causing you stress. Yes, because... It asked us, was there anything causing your stress? And the result was that um, you were ultimately contacted by Mr Wolfenden. Yes. And you'd referred him on to Mr McMartin. Yes. And is it fair to say that that occurred in the first week or so of December? Whenever the notes say. Um, well, 
just to just to assist your memory. Uh, I never ever thought these notes would end up in a royal commission. Do you understand that? Yeah, I do. I do <laughs> these were my private feelings and and notations, but I know when I wrote them, that's how I felt and that's what I thought. Right. Uh, an extra M, then, please. I'll just I'll just have the note brought up for you, just to refresh your memory. <coughs> Sorry, this is M, M for Mike. By reference to paragraph number one, noting that this is the 21st of December, 99, you say, look, two weeks ago, Mr. Wolfenden contacted you. Mm -hmm. You referred him on. Yes. Which puts it about early December. Would you accept that? Uh, yes. Right. Um, so that by the, by the time that Mr Wolfenden had spoken to you, you had met with Brian Houston, 28 November 99, and you had asked for certain things on behalf of AHA. Yes. And you believed, following that meeting, that your requests of Brian Houston on behalf of AHA were going to be met. Yes. And if an extra L for Lima could be brought up, please. Just trying to stay with the chronology in time. Um, you commence it by saying, I was overwhelmed by, uh, on Saturday, as a result of what had occurred. Do you agree with that? Yes, shows my emotional state about the whole thing. Yep. And is it fair to say that your emotional state, as being described as overwhelmed, was that you believed positive things were going to happen for AHA as a result of that meeting? Yes. And that one of the positive things that you believed was that counselling was going to be offered to him? Yes. And paid for by AOG? Yes. Because when you suggested it to Brian Houston the day before at the meeting, he was receptive to that? Seemed to be. And that he seemed to uh, acknowledge that it was an appropriate uh, response by the, the Assemblies of God towards AHA. I was asked what I thought should be done, and my opinion was that he should receive, AHA should receive expert counselling and the Assemblies of God should pay for it. And, that and was my suggestion. And yeah. that your suggestion was well received? Seemed to be. Um, in addition... Um, did you also come to the view that... Did I come to the view? A pro an appropriate, uh, another appropriate response was that Frank Houston was to be stood down from his ministry. Yes. That he wasn't going to be able to preach any further. Yes. And that in addition to doing the right thing, you say he was seen to be doing the right thing. Do you mean by that that he was going to raise... You understood he was going to raise it with at least the national executive? I thought the whole church should, would be told. And you thought that the whole church would be told because that's what Brian Houston was telling you would be done? He said that he would stand his father down. And you thought that was an appropriate response? From the church, yes. And from Brian? Yes. Just bear with me, I'm sorry. Um,
from meeting with AHA. It was compounded. It was that and it was the fact that the church weren't doing anything about it, weren't seen to be doing anything about it. Since the 16th of September? Oh, I don't know the exact date, sir. All right, that's fine. And then when you say there was a complete change in attitude, I advised him to see you for ministry. Who were you referring to when you said there was a complete change in attitude? I think from the father, Frank Houston. Could it be that there was a complete change in attitude by AHA because you'd informed him that Frank Houston had confessed and was being stood down? Could have been. I can't be sure. Right. So you're not able to resolve whether the reference to the complete change in attitude was on the part of Frank Houston or whether it was on the part of AHA. I can't be sure at this point of, of the proceedings. Do you want to please? Is that an appropriate time? Two o'clock. Thank you.
stand. Thanks, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Anna. May I ask that uh, an extra L be brought back to the screen, please? Pastor, can you hear me? I'm just adjusting these little things. Right. Ready? Yeah. Um, do you have on the screen before you the letter of the 29th of November that I was showing you just before the luncheon? Agenda? Yes, I do. And would you go to the fourth paragraph, which commences, when I rang AHA? Mm hmm Yes. And do you see in that paragraph that one of the things <coughs> you tell Brian Houston was that you had advised, I take it, AHA, to see you for ministry? Uh, Third last line. Oh, you're talking about seeing uh, Brian for ministry? Yes. Mm -hmm. is, is that the correct way of understanding that? Yes, I would say so. It's addressed to Brian, and I said I'd advise him to see you. That would be Brian. And so the next paragraph where you say, quote, should the Holy Spirit prompt you to contact him, his address and telephone number is, and then you provided those details. Did I? Um, I wonder if you just accept for me you did. It's just been taken out. Right. Has it been? I'm not sure. we'll, just, uh, we'll just check uh, the record. Uh, my understanding is it was not redacted, but... Uh, just a moment while we check the, uh, the original. Doesn't need to come up on the screen. No. Right. It saves time. My point of the question is not about whether or not the actual details was provided. It's more about the intent of this witness in, in extending that invitation. So if it saves time, I don't require the right. original. Um, Pastor Taylor, when you expressed an invitation in that letter to Brian Houston, were you inviting him to contact AHA and offer him the ministry um, and the counselling that you'd expected from the day, the meeting the day before? Well, I advised him to see if Mr. even I told you, isn't it? Yes, I would think so. Okay. Now, by reference, same document, a bit lower down where it has the handwritten entries. <clears throat> And would this be a correct interpretation of the f first two entries of the 30th of November and the 1st of December, and that you became aware that AHA was trying to contact uh, Brian? That's what his mother told me. And that you thought <coughs> that the, it would be a good strategy to contact Mr McMartin and tell him to get in contact with Brian about AHA's desire to speak to him. That's what it says, yes. And was it your expectation at that time that that was about AHA contacting Brian for both ministry and the counselling that you were suggesting? Ministry, I don't know about counselling. I don't think Brian's a qualified counsellor. 
Oh, sorry, there was a lack of precision in my question. Not that Brian would offer him counselling from himself, but that Brian would facilitate counselling by the AOG for AHA. That's what I was hoping for. And, and you were hoping for that because of what had been said to you at the meeting the day before? Was it the day before? Yeah, the 28th. Yeah. All right. Um, and the last line of that document where it says, case closed for me, brackets, I hope, close brackets, mm -hmm. was it your state of mind at that time that your involvement had ceased? Well, I thought he was going to get some counselling and get some help. So my pursuit of everybody to try to bring that about, there was some action in that direction. And did you therefore think that your involvement had ceased? I thought the case had ceased of me trying to get someone to listen. And yes, I did. You expected other people would then take it thereafter? Yes. The experts. Right. Um, may I ask that an extra M for Mike be brought on the screen, please? Okay. <clears throat> All right, again, this is the, the note you made to yourself in expectation of a meeting you're going to have with Mr McMartin. Yes. Can I ask you to read to yourself paragraph number two? Yes. When you've done that, please tell me. Just read it quietly to yourself. Yes. Just let me know when you've finished. Yes, I've read it. Did AHA's perception of Brian's attitude surprise you in view of what you'd expected from the meeting of the 28th of November? Nothing surprises me. It might now, but as at then, on the 21st of December 99, did it surprise you in view of what you'd expected would happen over that next I month? don't know. I can't tell you how I felt 16 years ago, 15 years ago. Um, when you use the word perception, um, is there, do you give it any special meaning? Is, is well, a... that's how I saw it. You may have seen it in a different way. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm asking you. Uh, you. You use the phrase AHA's perception. Mm -hmm. um, was there any reason why you phrased it that way? As opposed to say, AHA told you. Oh, I think it's a play on words in a way. It might be. So that's the point of my question. Um, when you use the word perception, do you mean by it, look, he's interpreted it that way, but there, there could have been another interpretation? I think that's of every situation. And did you use the word perception because you had an expectation from Brian that a different attitude would be demonstrated. I think I was just recording the facts as I saw them. Yeah. This was my private diary. <clears throat> um, earlier before the morning tea break, you were answering some questions by council assisting about the six-month period between December 99 and June 2000 when you came to write the letter to Brian Houston. Yes. And that I think you, you said that you were... Um, you felt that you'd been excluded at that point. I was. Um, did you, at the meeting with Mr McMartin, on or about the 21st of December 99, did you indicate to him that 
your role as you saw it had finished and you expected the church to take it over? No, I didn't express that. I just had an expectation. Um, it certainly was the way you felt about it at that time, wasn't it? Yes. Um, I thought they were going to give AHA the, uh, the support that he needed. And is it fair to say that you now know that as at the 22nd of December 99, that the Assemblies of God had determined at a meeting that various things would be done, including assistance to offering assistance to AHA? I believe it was mentioned yesterday and it's come up today. All right, and that was the first you knew about it? Yes. So that, would you accept... Uh, excuse me, assistance, what do you mean? Certainly can... Um, an extra KA1 be brought up on the screen, please. And, uh, I don't know anything about this. This is an executive, uh, special executive meeting, and uh, it wouldn't be right and proper for me even to know what went on there. Indeed. Um, so... Can I suggest this to you, that whatever it was that was resolved at this meeting, you would not have been informed of? Absolutely not informed. And can I ask to scroll down to paragraph number eight, please, or resolution eight? Can I ask you to read eight quietly to yourself, please, Pastor, and when you've done that, please tell me. Yes, I've read it. Um, you were not aware that th this resolution for the assistance to AHA had been decided at this meeting? It's a great pity I hadn't been told. Indeed. That's, um, but it's fair to say that the first you knew about it was once you attended this commission. Yes. Right. And that... Can I suggest this to you, that... Whilst there was a lack of courtesy towards you in that six-month period in keeping you informed, is it fair to say that, to your mind, your, you thought that your role had finished and that you had an expectation that the church would look after the interests of AHA? Yes. Um, just finally, can I ask that... Um, an extra O for Oscar. Be brought up on the screen, please, from tab two. And this is the your notes of the telephone call with Brian Houston yes. on the 19th of July 2000. It's a response to your letter yes. of uh, June, 26 June yes. 2000. Correct. Um, your attention was taken by... Council assisting to item 10, okay. being any future correspondence to be by phone. Yes. Um, did you understand that to be Brian Houston suggesting to you, look, if there's a problem, contact me personally and I'll give you a personal uh, attention? I thought that he didn't want uh, members of the uh, staff uh, to be informed about private matters, and I understand that. And is that because you had indicated to him the sensitivity of AHA to a public disclosure of the allegations? I didn't think I connected that at that time, no. Right. Uh, just excuse me, please, Your Honour, Commissioner. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Taylor. Uh, Pastor Taylor, my name is Craig Chowdhury. I appear for Australian Christian Churches. Can you hear me properly? I can. Thank you. The witness could be shown, please, uh, an extra H to her statement. It's a letter to John McMartin, 16 September 99.
You can see that in front of the screen there. I can. Oh, thank you. And uh, you were advised by Mr McMartin that there was a grievance process that the church had if a complaint was made to it, correct? Yes. All right. And if I take you to the third paragraph of that document, where you thanked Mr McMartin for making it so clear to you yes. of this grievance process, correct? Correct. And you advised Mr McMartin that you would convey this to AHA and ask him if he wants to pursue the matter further for the healing of both parties. I did. All right. Now, it was quite clear in your mind that it was AH, start again, AHA's decision whether he wanted to make a complaint to the church or not, correct? That's what I've been advised. I had to do everything according to what he wanted, what he gave me permission to do. Right. Uh, well, the advice you had received early on from Cherie Lewin, who was an independent counsellor, was that you must not do anything uh, without his consent, correct? Yes. All right. That he had to be the one who made the decision about his life. Yes. And you understood, didn't you, that the grievance process within the church required a written complaint? That's what uh, John McMartin said. Now, you were familiar, weren't you, uh, with the policies of the Assemblies of God at that time? What policies? Well, were you aware, generally, of the policies? There were policies in place. Were you aware of them? Which one? I'm asking you generally. Were you aware that there were policies in place? Yes. In 99, right? There, there were, were policies. Yes. Were you aware, separate to this communication with Mr McMartin, that there was a grievance process for ministers? I object. My friend is referring to a grievance process that was um, introduced at some later period after this time. Then, um, then I suggest the question be withdrawn. If it's a reference to the administration manual, which applied at that stage, then its proper name should be used. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Were you aware in 1999 of the administration manual of the Assemblies of God, uh, which is titled A Statement on Restoration and Reinstatement of Disciplined Ministers. Yes. Did you have copies of the policies of the Assemblies of God at your church, in your office? I have a manual, right. but uh, I haven't studied every particular aspect. I've read it, but not studied it. I, I accept that. I'm not suggesting you should have. In any event, if the witness could be shown, please, an extra G to uh, her statement. This is the letter that you sent to AHA, correct? Yes. All right. And if you look at paragraph two... Yes. ..you communicated to him in writing the advice you received from John McMartin, correct? Yes. And that there was a structure in place if there was a written accusation with time and place. Yes. Right. Did you also have a conversation with AHA about that? From memory, I did mention it, yes. So it's not that you just sent that letter, you also had a conversation with it? As far as I remember, I did mention it to AHA. It's the case, isn't it, that AHA did not want to go ahead with any complaint procedure through the church, correct? He was vacillating. One time he did and then the next time he didn't. Okay. He was very hurt and very disturbed. Uh, I will move to another document, but uh, we stay on this document if you go down to the fourth paragraph, where it says, the secular courts is not the way I believe to go, but to the church. Do you see that? Yes. 
That was your personal belief, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Thank you. The witness could be shown, please, uh, an extra J to her statement. This is a uh, file note of a conversation you've spoken with AHA, correct? Yes. I should ask you, did you make these notes at the time of the conversation or sometime afterwards or days mm. afterwards? Can you just tell me? Yes. When did you make the notes? I object. Oh, I, I can't remember. Uh, I made uh, them uh, soon uh, after. I wonder if you could just uh, stop for a moment there. I think yeah. a global... Um, question like that is inappropriate given the number of notes that we have. The answer is restricted perhaps to each document um, that might assist. Oh, I'll do it that way. Mm. Can you tell me when you made this note? I think you already started that answer, Pastor Taylor, that you can't remember. I can't remember exactly, but it would have been near the time of the happening or when it was fresh in my mind and... Frankly, it's not fresh in my mind. These notes are helping me. Of course. That's the reason why you made the notes. Exactly. Okay. And I just wanted to establish that at the time you made this note, it was fresh in your mind? It was. Thank you. Uh, it's quite clear that AHA uh, did not want to have anything to do with the church. His view was there'd be no benefit going to the church and the church wouldn't do anything about it. I think that's a very strong statement and would reflect his mood at that time, but not an overall attitude. Well, uh, at no time, to your knowledge, did AHA uh, put forward a written complaint to the Assemblies of God? No, he did not, and I believe not many people that have been sexually abused do. And you certainly did not make a written complaint to the church about Frank Houston. Not a formal one, but I think my letters indicate that down the track I revealed names and there was a, an incident. Thank you. Uh, did you... Uh, ever speak with AHA about compensation, that in he receiving some... Never. Did AHA ever mention to you that he'd received a significant sum of money, some ten or $12,000? Never. That comes as a surprise <clears throat> to you? Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr Mudford, whose name we've heard here, did he have a nickname? Yes. Was it Mad Dog? Yes, because of his background. Right. Was, he, right. was his background as a bikey, is that it? He was a bikey, but he'd been radically changed. Thank you. Uh, he was not a credentialed pastor with the Assemblies of God, was he, in 1999? I thought he was. I don't know. Didn't ask him. Yeah. Pardon me for a moment, Your Honour. Oh, I should uh, take you to this document. This is an extra M to your statement, please. You've been... Is that M? It's the 21 December. Yes, that's the document, please. You've been showing this document before... Pastor Taylor, but just take a moment to familiarise yourself with it again. Just let me know once you've recalled it. Well, I, I've got it here in front of me. Thank you. All right. Now, these are notes to speak to John McMartin when I spoke to him. Were these talking points for you to raise with Mr McMartin in, in a future phone call? Yes, I can't remember that I ever did raise them with him, but that's what I intended to speak about. Yes, I can't remember. Well, that's the next question I was going to ask you, if we can go to the chronology you did. Now, that's 
that could be brought up in uh, it's an A, an extra A to your statement. Just take a moment and I'll, you can just indicate to the Commission when you want to scroll down further to see the rest of the document. Uh, what do you want me to look at? Well, uh, I'm going to suggest to you that there's no record of around the 21st of December 1999 of you having a phone conversation or conversation in person with John McMartin. Although well, then I probably didn't have the conversation. All right. So the document we saw before, which is M, were notes of a conversation you were, or matters you wanted to raise with John McMartin, correct? Yes. Um, but you can't say whether, in fact, you ever had such a conversation. Yes, true. Thank you. Just pardon me for a moment. Oh, yes. And that's uh... Just pardon me for a moment. Uh, an extra R could be brought up, please. Uh, I think it's J. I've noted R, but it's actually J. I just want to check the date of that whether that's the right date of that note, 25 November 1999. Oh. You can't recall? If I put that date on the letter 15 years ago, I'd be more likely to be right then than today. I might uh, uh, see if I could uh, assist you if uh, document A could be brought up again, please. I'm not trying to trick you, I'm just trying to clear in my own mind whether that's whether you spoke to him on the 25th of November 1999 or was it earlier? Spoke to who? AHA. Well, I rang him on the 25th and I spoke to him on the 26th. Yes, you see in the chronology you've got, which is an extra A, you refer to conversation with, conversations with AHA on the 25th and 26th of November 1998, correct? Mm -hmm. But I can't see any note that you spoke to AHA on the 25th of November 1999. Should I have? Well, I'm just asking. Uh, this chronology that you've done, which is an extra A, when did you type that up? All this was done years ago. But was it done working backwards, or did you commence this on the first entry, and then as events occurred, you added to it? Well, I would say it's very obvious that I added to it as events happen because the latter part is written in, in pen. All right. Thank you. Uh, if you go back to J, next to J, that should be uh, in front of you. Can you recall if that conversation took place with AHA after 
you had spoken with John McMartin and Brian Houston? I can't tell you. All right, thank you. I have nothing further. Mr. Koenig. Thank you, Mum. Pastor Taylor, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Aaron. For the benefit of the people uh, not present in court, my name's Aaron Kernigan and I'm your lawyer in these proceedings. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Taylor, you've been asked some questions in relation to the reasons behind why you did not name AHA or Pastor Frank mm. during your initial meeting with uh, Mr McMartin. When you uh, didn't disclose that, during the meeting, were you asked by Pastor McMartin to disclose that? No. Did Pastor McMartin, so far as you can recall, make any effort to investigate in that meeting with you the details of what you were raising with him? No. Did he appear to take any notes? No. Did he ask for someone to sit in with him during the meeting to take notes for him? No. Did he confirm in writing to you the conference that you had had with him? I have nothing in writing. So far as you can recall, uh, you were there with your colleague, and just to get his name right, it wasn't Mad Dog, was it? Kevin. Kevin. Yes. Do you remember if Kevin was asked any questions by Pastor McMartin going to what this was all about? I can't really remember what he asked Kevin. So far as you re recollect, the meeting involved yourself and Kevin raising with a senior member of the church that there had been child abuse committed by another senior member of the church. Yes. And Pastor McMartin didn't make any inquiries of you about the details of that. No, he, we did say it happened 30 years prior. Yes. And aside from that particular detail? No. He didn't ask for further information? No. Is it your memory today, having seen the documents that you've seen during the course of these proceedings, that it was at that meeting that Pastor McMartin referred you on to Brian Houston? I know, I'd have to look at the letter. I object to that. That doesn't appear to be consistent with, firstly, the witness's evidence when taken to the letter of the 19th of May, 99, and the reference in that letter to the meeting of November, 98, and the reasons why it was decided not to go to Brian Houston. Yes, well, I'll come at it another way. Yes. Um, you're also asked some questions. I'm moving on to something else for the time being. Um, you're also asked some questions in relation to what you referred to in your statement as something of an investigation uh, that you led. I remember answering those questions from council assisting this morning. Just refresh me, please. You indicated that uh, during the course of the months that followed the initial disclosure and meeting between you and Kevin and AHA... Yes. Uh, ..that you took a number of steps to try to secure an interview or a meeting between AHA and Frank Houston. I did. How long after the initial meeting between yourself, Kevin and AHA did you begin those efforts? I'd have to look at the correspondence. I just ask you to look now at Annexure A on the screen in front of you. Yes. And you see that that chronology commences on the 27th of October 1998. Yes. A preamble to that at the top of the page. Yes. You see that there is an indication on the 3rd of November 1998 that AHA's mother, 
AHI yes. had disclosed certain details about yes. the son. Yes. There's further requests that follow and further interactions noted in the months that immediately follow. Yes. Having looked at that, yes. can you determine from there, and you might want to read down as far as the entry April 1999, roughly when it was that you first began your efforts to have Frank Houston meet with AHA? Can you ask me that again, sure. please? I'll direct your attention down the bottom half of the screen. You'll see April 1999. Yes. It says, rang Frank just prior to Easter. Yes. And uh, I'll ask you to accept from me, and others will check if I'm right about this, but that Easter Day in 1999 was uh, Sunday, April the 4th. Right. Now, what that entry there appears to record is that you've rung him prior to that particular entry, and now in April 1999 you're making a further entry that you've heard nothing uh, since he left for South Africa. Right. Is that how to read that entry? Yes. So would it be right to say that you, if not your first contact, you certainly had contact with Frank prior to April or in the very few, first few days of April 1999? It would appear that way. Is it your recollection, if you have any, of that contact, no. that you made Frank aware of what it was that you were going to be meeting or he was going to meet AHA about? I think the main thing uh, was that he would confess what he had done and AHA would have some satisfaction of that he took accountability for his actions yes. and was sorry. Now, if you look further up that chronology, you'll see there are further references to Frank. And you'll see that even as early as the 5th of November 1990... I'm sorry, the 25th of November 1998... Yeah. You recall having rang, or you record that you rang AHA... Yes. ...to see if he was ready to, to meet, meet with Frank... Frank. You've noted that AHA told you that he was. Yes. That you rang Frank. And you see the entry there, rang Frank 10am, in meeting 10.30 Frank rang. And then you've recorded the note amnesia with a number of, of question marks. Yes. And that was able, sarcasm. It was sarcasm. Why do you say that? Well, he said he forgot. Forgot what? About the meeting. And by... That phone call, the time of that phone call, 10.30 on the 25th of November 1998, is it your understanding from those notes and your own memory that Frank knew what he was going to be having a meeting with AHA about? Yes, absolutely. At that time, what role in the church did Frank have? He was a head pastor. <coughs> As far as I knew. Aside from your inquiries with Frank Houston in relation to this matter, did you have any other connection with Frank Houston at the time? No. He had a church in the city and I have a church in Mount Druitt. Uh, did you know of Brian Houston at this point in time? I'm talking about the 25th of November, 1998. Not personally, in an intimate way. You knew of him? Absolutely. And Everybody what, knew this family. What did you know was his role in the church at this time? I what did you that. understand? I, I understood that, that he the was the leader Just of... Wait a moment. Sorry. I would submit that my friend is conflating the two churches. We know that in 98 there were two separate churches. One was the Hills Christian Life Centre, of which Brian Houston was the... Pastor, and there was the Sydney Christian Life Centre, of which uh, Frank Houston was the, the pastor, and that to ask the question with the definite article, the church, conflates the two different churches for the purpose of this cross-examination. I'll, I'll rephrase the question, Your Honour. Uh, pastor Taylor, what did you know was his role, that's Brian Houston's role, in church at this time? 
he was a pastor of the CLC in Castle Hill or Borkham Hills and the leader of the Assemblies of God. And just so that everyone who's listening and the commissioners are clear, what connection did you understand he to have, if any, with Pastor McMartin? Well, Pastor McMartin was with the state executive. Thank you. Now, you mentioned before uh, in your evidence <clears throat> that it was your view that the church had a responsibility to clean up its own house. Do you remember saying that? Yes, I still believe that. And uh, that was in relation to what you thought the church should do before matters went to the authorities? Yes. Has your view on that changed over time? I still think the church should clean up its own act, but if anyone came to me today with a report of sexual abuse, I would follow the directive given by Pastor Ian Woods to send them straight to the police. And that's a directive that's been given since these matters? Yes. Or rather this matter. Um, on the 25th of November 1998, or around that time, who was the person that you recall within the church organisation or structure that you were mainly dealing with in relation to AHA? John McMartin, because we took it to him first. And as has been already stated, and it's a fair comment, we did not reveal the names of the perpetrator or the uh, victim. We were afraid. Someone said I was looking after my... Uh, my skin. Yes. Maybe that was right. But I didn't want to be involved in a libel suit either. When you say a libel suit, what were you concerned would happen to you? Well, if it was a false accusation, the church would have every right to proceed against me for libel. You can't go around saying that uh, someone did that wicked thing without proof. And it was at this time, late in 1998, that you didn't feel you had proof? I didn't feel I had proof. Was this at the time that AHA was, to use your word, vacillating? Yes. And did that feature of his situation at the time affect your view as to whether or not you had sufficient grounds to... Absolutely. Those allegations? I was also afraid he might hurt himself. He was so distressed. It's the case, isn't it, that your knowledge about what happened to AHA in the first case came via, or ultimately, via AHI. Exactly. His mother. His mother. Did you ever seek out details of what had happened to AHA directly from AHA? I couldn't broach the subject with him. He was too upset. But the efforts that you did take were in response to what you'd been able to glean or find out from the information available to you? Yes. All right. I'll just ask you to be shown Energia H. This is a document that you've been taken to just recently. Um, you were asked questions about your knowledge of policies and guidelines and manuals. Do you remember those questions? Well, some of them I do. Right. I'll ask you to have a look at the second paragraph there. Yes. First of all, just to be clear, this is a letter to whom? John McMartin. And it's dated the, I think it says the 16th of 16th September. 16th of September, 1999. Now, you've indicated in that second paragraph a concern expressed by 
someone else that Frank may face eternity with the matter unresolved. Yes. And that's because there was dis uh, there was repeated attempts to have Frank confess it. Yes. And start a process of restoration. Mm -hmm. And that he's dodged such a meeting. Yes. Did you ever receive an inquiry from Mr McMartin in relation to that comment? No. Were you ever asked to expand upon it? No. If you look at the third paragraph, you note your gratitude for making or well, having it made clear to you by, it seems, John McMartin, that there is a structure in place that can and will deal with such allegations. You see that? It's not on my screen yet. If you look at the next paragraph down, it starts, thank you for making it so clear. Oh, yes, I have that there. Now, do you remember what you were told about the structure? That it, if the allegation was in writing and signed by the complainant, it would be investigated. Is that all you were told? Yes. You've then noted in this letter to Pastor McMartin that you're going to convey that fact, that is the fact of the existence of a structure... Yes. ..to AHA, AHA... Yes. ..and ask him if he wants to pursue the matter further. Yes. And then you note, I will strongly advise him not to go to the secular courts. Yes. Which I've already done. Which I take it is a reference to the fact that you've already advised him not to go to the secular courts. Yes. Did you receive any instruction from Pastor McMartin or advice or information about whether or not it was appropriate for you to do that? I did not. He did not tell me that. No. Did Pastor McMartin indicate to you at any time that any of the conduct that you've referred to in that paragraph is inconsistent with the structures, policies or manuals that are in place for dealing with such matters? Which are we were looking at that's inappropriate? Well, for example, mm -hmm. informing uh, AHA... Right. No, he didn't... Advising him not to go to the secular courts. No, he did not tell me that. That's... That was me. Has anyone in the organisation of the church that you receive advice or information from given you advice or information about the appropriateness of that in relation to this matter? No. Ever? No. Never. Did you ever receive any response to this letter saying that before you speak with AHA further to check with Mr McMartin, Pastor McMartin? No. I'll ask you to have a look at Annex K now. I'll just get you to read that to refresh your memory of it. Yes. During this meeting, did Brian Houston, or do you recall Brian Houston saying anything to you about his own feelings in relation to the matter? He said he was in shock. Did he say anything else? He said he'd check with his children and Grandad had never touched them. He said that, did he? Yes. There's a sentence at line or point three which says they would do it wisely. Can you explain what that note means? That's what was said to me. They would have to be the one to explain what that meant. Did you understand in attending this meeting that you would be meeting with Brian Houston? Oh, yes. John McMartin organised that for me to meet with Brian and himself. And did he tell you what it was for? Well, I knew it was in relation to Frank Houston and 
and AHA. During this meeting, were you called upon to provide to Brian any explanation of what <laughs> no. had been complained of or reported to you by AHA? No. No? No. Did Brian ask you for any details? No. Did he ask you about his father being identified as the child abuser? No. He knew. Did he explain to you what his role was? No. Brian wouldn't explain his role to me. Why is that? I'm just a little village pastor. <laughs> and he is not. Or he was not. He's one of the, the biggest pastors in Australia, a very successful pastor. Did you understand what his role was in relation to the AHA uh, allegations during this meeting in 1999? Brian's role? Yes. Only that he was the leader of the, uh, of the Assemblies of God, apart from that. Did you understand him to be taking some sort of a role in the investigation of what had happened to AHA? I thought he'd be organising someone to do that. I think I suggested that the executive should handle it. Uh, I mean, that was rather forward of me to suggest to them what they should do, but that's what I thought. Was there any discussion about any view... I'll withdraw that. Did you have, during this meeting, any view about the appropriateness of Brian having a role in the investigation of allegations against his father of child abuse? No, at that time, no. Did you raise any of that with no. either Brian or John McMartin at that interview? I was, I was overawed. I was just glad something was going to be done, but they wouldn't seek my counsel about anything. Now, originally... I'll withdraw that. You mentioned before that ordinarily this is an issue that you yourself would have raised with a person by the name of uh, Ian Woods. Yes. And uh, was he in charge of the northwest Sydney district? He was. And it didn't happen that way because uh, Kevin uh, went for advice directly to his pastor, who he did. was Pastor McMartin. I think had I gone to Ian Woods, it would have gone completely in a different direction. You didn't go to Ian Woods, though. No, I didn't. didn't. I regret so, that. I'm sorry, you said you regret that? I regret it. When you say that you, you expect or you imagine it would have been dealt with differently, differently how? Because I think Ian is a very strong man. He was a school teacher, loved children, had experience with children, and I think he would have got action a lot quicker. When Pastor McMartin met with you the first time, so before this meeting in November 99, that's on the screen, the first time he met with you and Kevin, what did you... You mean 98, do you? Yes, I said before that meeting in 99. What did you take to be his view or interest in the information you were giving him? I'm sorry to say... But in most of these cases, I didn't find any difference here. People don't want to know anything about it. They wish you'd go away and handle it yourself. And in this particular case, what did you think was Mr McMartin's view of the matter? That was my view at the time. I may be wrong, but that was my impression. I'll ask you to look at Annexure L. I object to that. At the, the conclusion of fact, without identifying the facts in support of that conclusion, don't enable us to scrutinise the validity of the conclusion. So that my friend has invited from the witness a conclusion. What did you think was the, uh, the view of Mr McMartin about this? The witness has said, well, it was my view that he didn't want anything to do with it. Yes. We haven't been... We haven't been told what were the facts that uh, enabled him to come to that conclusion. 
I mean, that, that's really as far as that can go. Yeah. Higgins, I don't think there's any value from our point of view in taking that any further. Sure, um, it is, as you say, it is what it is, and that's it's, that's the limitations of that part of the evidence. Mm -hmm. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. If you could have a look at Annex L. Yes. Now that's a document that you wrote to Brian Houston. Yes. On the 29th of November 1999. Mm -hmm. This is after a meeting with him. Yes. And is it accurate to say that this document re records a positive view by you at that time yes. of Brian Houston's efforts in relation to the investigation? Yes. You say that you were overwhelmed. You've been asked some questions by counsel in relation to what that means. One of the answers you gave was that that shows what your emotional state was at the time. Do you remember saying that? I do, because this had been going on for a year. What was your emotional state at the time, so far as you can recall? Uh, I was very stressed about the whole matter not being resolved. And so when there were some definite steps being made... I was, I suppose I could have used the word overjoyed, I suppose. Um, in that letter, you can see that um, you are recording for Brian's attention a number of details about steps you've taken in relation to talking to AHI mm -hmm. and AHA. Yes. Now, did Brian respond to this letter so far as you can recall? No. I see that it says there that in the fourth paragraph down, the third bottom line, that he, which is a reference to AHA, wanted to know if you told Brian that he was thinking of legal proceedings. Do you see that? Yes. It goes on to say that you said, of course, that Brian knows everything there is to know to this point. Yes. So you'd informed Brian of that fact, yes. had you? Yes, yes. Now, I'd ask you to look, bear that document in mind and look at Annex M for Mary. You see, this is the notes that you were taken to a little while ago. Yes. Asking questions about what the function of these notes were. This was you recording some matters that you would you turned your mind to and proposed yes. to raise during a conversation yes. with John McMartin. I can't remember whether I ever did. Yes. When you've recorded here your concerns, you see the date, the 21st of December? Yes. Now, the, the document that you've just looked at a moment ago was dated the 29th of November, yes. 99. This is just prior to Christmas. So yes. A little under a month later, you see that, or is it fair to say that what you've recorded there indicates that your view, your positive view that you had at the end of the month when talking to Brian Houston seems to have changed? Yes. Can you see that it suggests from this document at least that your view had become more pessimistic? Yes, because I'd heard reports that his father was still preaching. And did you get those reports after you'd spoken to Brian Houston at the end of November? Yes. You see, the last paragraph, number five, you record some 
sympathy or empathy for the way that AHA must be feeling. Mm. Yes, I did. Is that a feeling that you'd only had at around about the 21st of December or was that a more long-term feeling that had been developing? I think it had been developing because of the lack of interest in the case and in myself, I suppose, as well. Is it the case that you yourself were offered any counselling? Never. Or support in relation to the matters that you had been dealing with? Never. Did anyone ever provide you with information or access to a resource that could help you deal with your feelings and your circumstance? Never. When you've recorded here that you were going to raise these things with John McMartin, was it your hope that someone would come to your assistance? Well, I hope that John would. Is it fair to say, based on looking at this, that you recall feeling, at that time at least, that no one was going to come to your assistance? Yes. Now, if you could look at Annick Jaren for November. This is the last time that you wrote to Brian Houston about yes. these matters, is that right? Yes. You've since seen documentation that suggests action had been taken of some sort and things had been done before I you have. written this. I've seen that today. today. This document written by you, mm. I suggest to you, and you can agree or disagree, but I suggest to you, indicates that you were, at that time at least, feeling desperate about having the situation resolved. I was. And you remember being asked a question or a point being made about there being a lack of courtesy in informing you of what was going on. How long do you remember before you wrote this letter that you were given any information at all about what was happening with the AHA case? I wasn't given any information whatsoever. In fact, you make a direct appeal to the integrity of Brian Houston in this document, a request repeatedly for counselling, for AHA. Yes. You make a number of somewhat spiritual comments, seeking to appeal to his sense of spiritual integrity and responsibility. Yes. When he called you then, and if you could look at Anixia O for Oscar, and you've made this note of this conversation, Do you remember Brian being angry with you? He was very angry. And he was angry because you'd written the letter? I think he was angry because he dealt with it and I was accusing him of not having dealt with it, but of course I didn't know. You see, line number seven... Yes. ..that he told you... Did he, that his father had been abused as a child? Yes, he did. Well, how did that come up? I don't know. It just came up in the conversation. Did you see at number eight, he would speak to his mother about a meeting with you? <laughs> she never did. It never happened. What was the purpose of that? I don't know, but his mother was just the loveliest person. We used to preach together in camps. I don't know. Perhaps he thought his mother could counsel me or comfort me in some way. So is it right then that at the time you had this phone call, you still felt yourself distressed about the circumstances? Well, yes, I did. And I felt um, rebuked 
by the phone call. And I think I said here I apologise because uh, of the timing of the letter that I wrote. It was close to the big Hillsong gathering, which is a fantastic gathering. And, um, you know, where else do you see 20,000 young people meeting together for a week without an incident? Pastor Taylor, you've recorded here that Brian Houston told you that Frank had told the truth about what happened. Yes, but he didn't. I'm sorry, could you repeat that again? I don't believe Frank told the truth. So there was a discussion between you and Brian, was there, about what Frank had said had happened with AHJ? Only in that meeting where he said that uh, AHJ had walked through the room minus his clothes, that's all. In this particular phone call, was it your impression that Brian Houston was to some extent defending his father? Yes. He then told you that any future correspondence was to be by phone? Yes. You've been asked a question about that. I'm going to ask you another question. The, that indication, did you understand that to be an order? Yes, I thought he didn't want his staff to know about private matters. And his staff could know if it was in writing? Because they opened his mail. Did you say to him anything about whether or not you thought that proper? Uh, that is... No, I, ju I, I, I just address the fact that it's very hard to get through to him on the phone because he's so busy and... You were told that <coughs> Kevin had been spoken to? Yes. Ron, I, I object to this. Um, the witness is being taken to the basis of her conclusion for why number 10 was requested of her. And the witness has said that she believed it was so that um, his staff did not become aware of his correspondence. But the witness hasn't been asked is whether that was actually said to her by uh, yeah. Mr Houston. So it's quite unfair the way it's been left. Well, that, that's not what the witness said. The witness said of private matters, not of the existence of the correspondence. That the, the complaint is not as to whether it's private matters or correspondence. The complaint is that the witness has said this was her belief, but, we, but what my friend hasn't done is taken the witness to the basis of that belief. All right, well, I'll ask. And, and in a non-leading fashion, I, I would request for it to have any value at all. Um, you see uh, number 10 on that list? Yes. Is that a belief that you've recorded there? No, he to ask me. I object to that. That's he... not the complaint that I'm making, that number 10 was a belief. Yeah. It's the basis of her belief, yes, of the utility of it. Did he tell you why he was asking you to have future correspondence by phone? Because the staff opened his mail. Is that what he said? Yes. Did he say why that was a problem? No, I didn't ask. He can run his church the way he wants. It's not my business. He noted that his father was very depressed at that time. Yes. Did he... What were the words he used? I don't remember. What, what did you take to be the reason he was telling you that? Get my sympathy.
Do you recall him saying we've something about organising counselling or anything like that? No, but he did say that the, a meeting, number three, a meeting had been taken place, etc. Number three. With the elder president? Yes. And was there any further discussion about no. that meeting? At the, at the conclusion of that phone call, I heard nothing from anyone involved, AHA, AHI, uh, John McMartin, Brian Houston, nothing. I heard nothing after that phone call. I knew nothing about the meeting. The money came up yesterday. I knew nothing about any of that. Pastor Taylor, following on from 2000, were you, did you ever become aware of any review being taken or undertaken in any part of the organisation regarding Frank Houston? No, I'm not aware of it. Unaware. So far as you can recall, have you seen any information requesting further information from the congregation regarding Frank Houston? Which congregation? Your congregation. My congregation? Yes. No. Has there been, to your knowledge, any inquiry into Frank Houston and his conduct with children? Not to my knowledge. Since uh, that phone call in 2000 with Brian Houston, have you spoken to any senior figure in the organisation about the AHA case? I object to that. Which organisation? AOG, Hills Christian Life, Sydney Christian Life, I'll rephrase Hill Song. I'll rephrase it. Have you ever spoken to Brian Houston again about AHA? Not to my knowledge. I don't recall ever speaking to him about it. Um, in, relation, in relation to AOG, have you had any discussions with anyone representing that organisation? No. About AHA since 2000? No. What about ACC? Same. No. Is it right to say that the first time that anyone approached you on behalf of those organisations since the 2000 phone call with Brian Houston was in the lead-up to your appearance before this Royal Commission? Correct. Now, you're currently still a pastor? Yes. And you, your, um, your pastoral work extends to receiving advice from time to time and sharing of resources with larger organisations? Yes including organisations that we've referred to just a moment ago, ACC and AOG. Is well, that right? ACC has replaced oh, AOG. Yes. Is that right? You can yes. You receive that? And is it also right, Pastor Taylor, that you've not been given any legal representation or assistance? With respect, this cannot be a legitimate issue for the subject matter of this commission. Well, I press it in my respectful submission when a person who has fulfilled the function that Pastor Taylor has within the organisation has had the experience that she has had, it is very relevant to see how she is treated or assisted or not assisted then and now. The difficulty with that, Mr Koenigan, is it potentially opens up a whole range of issues about what conversations were had and what um, Pastor Taylor did or didn't do about seeking independent advice and uh, oh. if there's a if you've got a direct proposition to put to Pastor Taylor about um, her um, current view about the way in which she was treated I'm um, comfortable with you pursuing that I hear you I'll, I'll, I will put it in those terms um, Pastor Taylor looking back now at what happened as you dealt with the AHA case. What is your opinion about the way that you were helped or supported to make that case known and to make the details known to the people who should know? 
Very little, if any. Did you feel that there was anything that could have been done better to support you? It would have been good to have someone to be able to debrief to that I could trust because one of the things that happens to pastors that have this put on them is you can't talk to anybody. You're carrying all this around inside. And I, I don't think there's any provision made for that. As a matter of fact, you're made to feel like you're a bit of a troublemaker. Yes, thank you, Your Honour. Mr Cregan. Mr Beckett. Yes, nothing in re motion. Thank you. Pastor Taylor, um, thank you for being patient with us and... Um, participating in giving evidence throughout the day. I just wondered before excusing you yes. um, whether or not there was um, anything in particular in light of the last uh, comments to Mr Kernigan, whether there was anything more you wanted to say to the Royal Commission um, about your involvement. Um, it might be that something that you wanted to say hasn't been the subject of a question to you before us, but that it, there may be something that you do wish to convey to us. Thank you very much. I think my hope that from this Royal Commission uh, will come some guidelines that can be given to uh, institutions about how to handle these particular cases uh, because uh, when they're put on your table and come across to you, there's an area of uh, you haven't handled it before, you try to do your best. So some guidelines would really be great and I hope the Royal Commission uh, is able to produce guidelines that will actually become a code of conduct for those involved in institutions, whether it be the church or whatever. So does it follow from that, um, Pastor, that you feel uh, currently um, still um, underconfident, if I can express it in that way, about how you would respond in, um, in October 2014 if the same situation arose? I would respond in an entirely different way. And I think one of the things that really got to me was the fact that AHA is still... Uh, his issues are still unresolved and he's still hurting and he's still wounded. And to me, uh, the case is not really successfully concluded till there's some kind of healing for him. Thank you. Anything arising out of that for anyone? No, nothing arising. Oh, I'll have a question about that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if the witness could be shown, please. It's uh, KA15. should come up on the screen, please, Pastor Taylor. Yes, it's there. And uh, I'll scroll you down. That's just the opening page. If we go to the second page. Just put it there. Just take a moment to read that. Let me know when you've read what's on the screen. Yes, I've read it. All right. Uh, does that uh, refresh your memory? Have you seen that before? I don't believe I have. All right. Uh, do you attend conferences? Yes. There's conferences of pastors? Yes, there's one on now in Port Macquarie. Correct. 
in Australian Christian churches, correct? Yes. And uh, policies are discussed and uh, adopted at such meetings, aren't they? At conferences? Yes. Some policies, yes. Yeah. Right. But you're not aware of this grievance procedure at all? Do you want me to scroll down a bit further? Thank you. If we just stop there, just take a moment to read that. I don't think you'll ever get a person who's been sexually abused to write the allegation. Well, what, my question is, you're not aware of this policy, is that correct? I'm aware of the policy, but I, I'm aware that there is a policy, put it that way, but I haven't studied it. All right. Yes, I'm nothing further. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Taylor. Uh, thank you, and you're thank excused. You so much. Yes, Mr. Beckett. Yes, I call Keith Ainge. take the oath or the affirmation? An affirmation. Thank you. All right. Could you repeat after me, please? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. To this Royal Commission. To this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Just take a Thank seat you. where you are, please. <coughs> Pastor, I wonder if you could state your full name for the Royal Commission, please. Keith Ainge. And uh, you've provided your address to the Royal Commission. Yes, I did. And in this matter, you've given us a statement dated 19th of September 2014. That's correct. Um, is that statement true and correct? Yes. Best of your knowledge, I tender the statement. 18.008. Uh, so you're currently the senior pastor at uh, Desert Life Church in Alice Springs, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And um, how long have you been a pastor for in total since you were first ordained? In total, 41 years. And you were the National Secretary of the Assemblies of God Australia from May 1995 to May 2011, is that right? That's correct. And... Um, did you have a ministry at that stage? That is, did you have your own church that you were the senior pastor at? For approximately half of that time, yes. I was the senior pastor in a church as well as fulfilling the role of national secretary. And the other half, I was full-time in the role of national secretary. By 1999, um, what was the position? In 1999, I was full-time as national secretary based in Melbourne. All right, and... At that stage, the, uh, the Assemblies of God in Australia, as it was then known, was uh, an incorporated entity under the Corporations Act. Is that right? Well, the Assemblies of God, as a denomination, is an unincorporated association. But, but the Assemblies of God does have a corporate, a corporate entity too. All right. Assemblies of God in Australia Limited. And in terms of the workings of the National Executive, that's guided by a constitution, is it not? Yes, the constitution was for the unincorporated association. Right, and the bylaws that applied to that as well. Yes, that's right. All right. But um, in any event, in terms of the way that the Assemblies of God Australia worked at that time, it was essentially operated in the same way as, a, as an incorporated entity would work. Is that right? Um, essentially, yes. 
Yes. In terms of, for example, the secretary would keep minutes of meetings. Yes, that's correct. There would be notification of a meeting and an AGM would, uh, sorry, and a draft agenda would go out for approval. That's correct, yes. Um, and then uh, you would convene, and uh, was there a quorum that was needed, for example, for uh, the national executive in that Yes, that there stage? was a quorum. Yes, what was that? Um, I believe in excess of 50% of those who were members of the executive. Yes, and the membership of the national executive is determined at uh, national conference, is that right? It was an elected... Uh, they were elected positions at the national conference every two years. Yes, and uh, there was a process for uh, installing people in between if there were any vacancies. That's correct, yes. yes. All right. Um, now, you've given some evidence in your statement um, about becoming aware of allegations against Pastor Frank Houston on the 22nd of December 1999. You see it? You see that in your statement? Yes, that's yes. correct. And that was the date of the uh, the special executive meeting of the national executive, is that right? That is right, yes. All right. So can I ask you, you were the national secretary at the time. What did you know about the allegations against Frank Houston prior to that date? I wasn't aware that there were any allegations against him prior to that date. All right. Were you told of a reason for the convening of a meeting? No, I had a call from Brian Houston to say that there was a major issue that needed to be discussed and could I uh, convene a meeting as soon as possible. All right. Did he, did he tell you what that, what that major issue was? No, he didn't. Did you receive anything in writing from him detailing what the issue was? No. Um, the notification of the meeting, uh, was, was that sent out by you? It was... As I recall, and of course it is 15 years ago, but my recollection is that it was by telephone conversations with the people concerned to ascertain who was available and when they were available. All right. And how did it come to be that the, that the meeting was t took place at Sydney Airport? We held a number of meetings in the Qantas Club business rooms at the Sydney Airport. If we had a meeting, the people had to fly in from interstate... Yes. It was convenient to fly and to have the meeting and then they'd fly straight out again. All right. Was that, uh, that decision made by um, Pastor Brian Houston or by you or by somebody else? Probably by me, in consultation with him, I would think. All right. Now... We have uh, the minute of that particular meeting and I'll just take you... That'll come up on the screen. It's Tender Bundle, document number three. Uh, you see that's the, the minutes of the special executive meeting there, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And it's just the one page? Yes. And these are minutes that were kept by you? I took those minutes, yes. All right. Uh, now, you'll see at the top there that the people attending included John Lewis, um, Brian Houston, uh, Wayne Alcorn and yourself. Is that right? Yes. All right. Um, now, um, you say there that... Um, you've noted there that John Lewis is the chairman of the meeting at the top of the minutes. That's, That's correct. correct. Isn't it? Um, in your statement to, to the Royal Commission, Commission, you say that the meeting was chaired by Brian Houston. Is that right? No, the, the situation was that since no one was, or with the exception of Wayne Alcorn, who had had some previous um, information as to what the meeting was about, no one else who attended the meeting had any information Yes. And so Brian Houston chaired the meeting as he normally would. Yes. But immediately mentioned that this was in relation to his father. Yes. And it was inappropriate for him to be the chairman. And he asked John Lewis to take the chair, which he did immediately. All right. So, so all of the business was conducted with John Lewis in the chair. All right. So, well, just with respect to the last remark of yours, it seems to contradict what you said. It appears to be the case that, as you say... Brian Houston chaired the meeting 
and then provided a report to the meeting about what it was about and what he had done? Is that no, right? that's not what I said. I said that Brian chaired the meeting for the opening right. and then immediately handed over the chair and it was taken by John Lewis from that point and then Brian Houston was asked for a report in relation to what the situation was. I see, and but um, he, was, he remained in the room, did he? He remained in the room. For the yes. entirety of the meeting? He remained in the room for the entirety of the meeting. Yes, all right. And um, he made contributions to, to the meeting throughout it, is that right? He made contributions as requested, yes. uh, simply because he was the only one who knew the situation of what had happened, but he wasn't involved in any decision making and they made no contribution in relation to the, the decisions that well, were determined there. I'll just ask you about that. Um, I'm, there's no note here of um, these, these uh, ten items being moved or seconded by anybody, is there? That was simply agreed. Yes, it was agreed. It, it was all unanimous agreement of those who were present. All right. And um, were, was each of them put to the vote? Um, it was each of them. It was asked, are we agreed in relation to this? And there was no vote required because there's unanimous yeah, so agreement to everything. So what's reflected here is effectively the consensus of the meeting. Yes. And at no stage did Brian Houston uh, exempt himself from the meeting, did he? No, he was present, yes. but he wasn't involved in discussion in relation to the um, decisions of the meeting. He simply answered questions as required. All right. And there was no distinguishing... Sorry, I withdraw that. Well, when you say he wasn't involved in discussion in relation to the decisions of the meeting, he was certainly asked to report on what he had done up to that particular period, wasn't he? That's correct. All right. And then there was discussion about what would be done, at least in a general way, with respect to the various elements that are set out in the minutes. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And then the chair said something along the lines of, are we, are we agreed on the particular matters that are noted in the minutes? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yes. And there's no indication from you that, that Brian Houston exempted himself, removed himself from the meeting during, during that particular occasion? There's no indication in the minutes at all, no. All right. Now, let's go through what happened. Um, Clearly, these minutes were, were, met, were written after the event, is that right? No, they were written during the event. Were they? All right. Um, and Brian Houston informed the meeting that an allegation had been made against Reverend Frank Houston, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And that it related to uh, an act of sexual abuse 30 years ago, is that right? Yes. Um, and that it in, although you don't note it here, it involved a child 30 years ago. Was that um, understood? Oh, no, I, we certainly were aware that it involved someone who was underaged. Um, I wasn't aware of the age of the child, and there's still mm. some... Uh, obviously, there's been questions raised in the last couple of days as to how old the child was, but there was no question that it was someone who was underage. All right, and uh, I think I understand from your statement that... Um, the name of the complainant was not disclosed? No, the name of the complainant was never disclosed. All right. And what did you understand? Sorry, I withdraw that. What did Brian Houston say to the meeting about what he had done with respect to the complaint? Perhaps, Sorry, if I'm allowed I, I, to... I might withdraw that and ask it in, in a more specific way. Did, um, did um, Pastor Brian Houston tell you specifically how the allegation had come to him? Um, if I could just answer it with a comment <coughs> and then come to the answer. The, um, this particular meeting was probably the most difficult meeting that I was involved in in 16 years 
as national secretary in that he took us totally by surprise and uh, there was no indication of anything before the meeting took place. And so, with it being 15 years ago, I can't be absolutely certain as to who said what, except in line with what's recorded in the minutes, but I can certainly give you impressions, uh, as I recall now, of what happened. And um, well, Rather than impressions, if you can just say what you remember, and if what you don't I remember, remember then, yep. then, um, then we'll take that and move on. Um, so, just going back to my question, what was the what was the allegation and who had communicated it to uh, Brian Houston? Uh, Brian Houston indicated that there had been an allegation against his father of um, sexually immoral behaviour. Um, there was not a great deal of detail in relation to what that behaviour involved and there was an indication that he had heard I believe through Kevin Mudford, as I, as I recall, that the, um, the complaint had come from him, but I can't be absolutely certain of that. I just know that the, the complaint had come to him and he was obviously very distressed about it. Um, all right, and you said there was not a great deal of detail. What detail was there? Uh, the only detail that I recall is that it was a sexual sexual act with someone who was a minor, and um, as far as our position in relation to sexual immorality is concerned, that was sufficient for us to take action on. Now, you use then, and uh, in the minutes it refers to an act singular... Is that what you recall, that there was just a single act or was there more than one act communicated to the meeting? My recollection is there was only one act communicated to the meeting, which was the, rec which was the information that Brian Houston had. But I do recall there was discussion in the meeting um, in relation to the fact that if there's one act, there are often other acts and we weren't aware of what they may or may not have been. All right, so who to your understanding, had had contact with the complainant by the 22nd of December 1999? Um, my understanding was that the complainant uh, didn't want to be contacted. I'm not, a, I'm not sure whether Brian Houston had had any contact with him. Did he say whether he had any contact with him? I can't recall. All right. What steps had he taken to investigate the complaint? He'd spoken to his father and his father had admitted to the fact that there was truth in it. Truth in what? In the allegation of inappropriate sexual behaviour. <coughs> Those words were used, were they? No. That's as I recall it now. And, and um, who had received that um, admission? Brian Houston. Um, and what steps had been taken at that stage to engage the, uh, the state executive, if any, in the allegations? I wasn't aware of what steps had been taken to engage the state executive. All right. And what about the national executive? Were there other members of the national executive other than Brian Houston who had been involved in addressing this complaint? Yes, I was aware that um, John McMartin had spoken with Wayne Alcorn to get advice as to what he should do. How did you come to know that? It, was, it came up in the meeting. Did Mr Alcorn say that or somebody else? Um, I believe Mr Alcorn. All right. Um, and... You say at paragraph three, sorry, the meeting minutes record at paragraph three, <coughs> that it was agreed that the president of the AOG, Brian Houston, had acted appropriately in su suspending the credential of F. Houston, sending him down from ministry and calling the special meeting of the national executive. Is that right? Yes, that's right. All right. So do I take that to mean that the act of suspension had occurred <coughs> prior to the meeting? Yes. And that there had been no notification of you as the National Secretary 
of that suspension prior to the 22nd of December? No, our constitution didn't require that. The constitution required that the, the national president has the power in extreme circumstances to suspend the credential simply for the, um, the safety of everyone concerned with a view to calling a meeting as soon as possible after that suspension. All right. And the, uh, in any event, the National Executive approved of the suspension, is that right? Yes, that's correct. OK. And then it was agreed at paragraph four that um, the credential be withd withdrawn forthwith. Well, it had been withdrawn already, hadn't it? It had been suspended, yes. withdrawn. It's, it effectively was the same thing, but it was just formalising something that had been done as an emergency measure. And then the process was that um, Father, sorry, Pastor Frank Houston would be in, invited to enter a restoration program. Is that right? Yes. If I was rewording that now, yes, but... I would say that he'd be invited to apply to enter a restoration program because it's an application process and it has to be approved before he can enter a restoration All program. Right. But in any event, the view of the National Executive was that it was appropriate for him to engage in such a program. It, the difficulty that we faced was well, that... Can I have an answer to my question first before you provide an explanation? Sorry? Can I have an, expl can I have an answer to my question, please? At that time, yes. Yes, thank you. Um, and then if we go on, he was to be supervised by the State Superintendent of the Assemblies of God? That's correct. Did he not minister publicly for 12 months? That's correct. And he not receive his credential back, I presume that means, until the New South Wales Superintendent recommended that occur, um, and that that could only occur after at least two years. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and that he be offered counselling? That's correct. All right. Um, so just so I understand that, what's the difference between the, the fourth and the fifth dot point? How could he refrain from public ministry for 12 months, um, yet not get his credential back for two years? There seems to be a 12-month period where it seems he could publicly minister but not have a credential. Is, is that right? Well, effectively, the ACC doesn't have the power to stop anyone from ministering publicly outside of ACC churches. And so it's a moral authority. And so the, the policy that we were functioning with allowed that if people were to uh, wish to be involved in a ministry, but not in a, full, uh, not in a pastoral ministry as a credential minister of the Assemblies of God, then after 12 months, if they were... Um, behaving appropriately, they could begin to have some ministry, but they couldn't function as a credentialed minister for at least two years. So this process that's being described here is essentially one in which the, the credential is withdrawn, but then a process of rehabilitation or restoration of the pastor is engaged in over a two-year period, with the aim being ultimately restoration to... Um, credential. Is that right? Our policy did specifically state that the first thing is restoration to a relationship with God and to family and in some circumstances restoration of ministry but it was never guaranteed. All right. Um, but there was some anticipation that this, uh, this process would go through and if the appropriate steps by... If the appropriate steps were taken then, then he, he in... could be restored. As long as he was in compliance with the policy, yes. All right. Now, you say in the interest of the complainant not to notify the movement of this disciplinary action. You see that um, entry yes. in the minutes? All right. Now, did you appreciate by that that um, the matter could be notified to the movement without disclosing the name or identity of the complainant? Um, oh, it was certainly possible to do that. Yes. Um, perhaps I should ask you, what did you mean by, when you wrote this minute, in the interest of the complainant? Well, there was a thought that there was no desire to 
bring attention to the complainant who had indicated, in fact, that he didn't want any, any action to take place at that, this stage. That was what Brian Houston communicated to you, is that right? That's correct. All right. Now, there are some further steps taken at six. Um, it was agreed that Brian Houston would notify Frank Houston of the decision of the executive. Is that right? That's correct. So um, he, is nationally, as national president, would go back and liaise with um, the alleged perpetrator of the abuse. Is that yes. right? Yes. And um, do I take it that the meeting, that was a resolution of the meeting? Yes. And that he thought that that was appropriate to do? It was felt that that was appropriate, yes. yes. All right. Um, now, there's some mention there further about Mr Lewis and Mr Alcorn meeting with Mad Dog Morgan and informing It should be of Mudford. I was... I actually didn't know the man at the time and made a mistake in the minutes that I recorded right. there. Thank you. But in any event, um, the idea was to go back to him because he, he had um, provided the information through to Brian Houston. Is that right? That's correct. All right. And then at 8... It was agreed that Brian Houston would meet with the complainant and explain the process of discipline and restoration that has been followed. Is that right? Yes. Um, again, the meeting determined that that was the, an appropriate course of action to take. Only on the basis that the meeting had no indication of the name, the identity or contact details for the complainant at his request. But in any event, you didn't, uh, you didn't consider the possibility of appointing somebody else from the National Executive to undertake that task, did you? No. And uh, you didn't consider perhaps somebody from the State Executive might be appropriate to undertake that task? No. Uh, and then you say he was, it was agreed that he'd be offered counselling if he desires it? That's correct. And who was to pay for that counselling, to your understanding? Um, the ACC, AOG would have paid for the counselling. <clears throat> All right. Um, and at nine, you say, it was noted that legal advice had been obtained as to our obligations in this matter. Do you see that? Yes. Did you obtain that legal advice? No. Um, was that legal advice that had been provided to Brian Houston? I actually don't have an answer to that. I don't recall what, what the, um, the situation was in relation to that legal advice. I do know that no one left the meeting in order to obtain legal advice, so it would have been someone who was present in the meeting who indicated that they had received legal advice. And my recollection is that the advice was that if the complainant was um, of age, and we're talking someone who was over the age of 30 and did not wish us to go to the, the police and report the matter, then we were not legally required to do it because he had the ability to do it himself. Now, are you, is that what you recall from the meeting about that particular issue or is that something that you recall today? That's what I recall from the meeting. All right. Um, did um, Brian Houston indicate to you that he'd spoken to a barrister and obtained the information from him or her? I'm not aware of that. I can't recall it. Do you recall <coughs> Brian Houston saying <coughs> to the meeting that um, he had been advised by a barrister that if the matter goes to court, his father would surely be incarcerated for the crime? I have no recollection of that whatsoever. All right. Now, the, do I take it from your answer just a moment ago? Uh, that the legal advice related to the matter being taken to the police. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And so there was some discussion at the meeting as to whether the National Executive should report the matter to the police. Yes, there was. And was an indication provided by Brian Houston or somebody else as to what um, AHA's, or the complainant, I should say, is attitude to going to the police? I don't recall any mention of AHA's attitude towards the police, except for the fact that he didn't want the matter to be investigated. He didn't want to lodge an official complaint. 
All right. Um, where is that in the minutes that um, he did not wish to make a formal? Oh, sorry, if you go back to one of point the very two. early points, I think point two, perhaps or three. All right. But notwithstanding that. Um, point two. Yes, thank you. And um, notwithstanding that he did not, that um, you were told that he did not wish to make a formal complaint, you considered that the national executive should properly consider the matter. Look, our major concern what is to do the right thing and to deal with issues. And the fact that Frank Houston had confessed to the act meant that we felt it was totally inappropriate for us not to take action to suspend his credential immediately. Yeah, so in, in other words, the matter was of such seriousness, wasn't it, that notwithstanding that the complainant had not made a formal complaint, it was important for the national executive to deal with the matter and take action. Is That's that, correct. Is that reasonable? Yes. Now, um, um, you're familiar, I presume, with uh, the administration manual of um, 1999? Yes. And um, as National Secretary, I presume that you were at the National Conference that approved the administration manual in May of that year. Is that right? I was, yes. Right. Uh, I, just, uh, I wonder if you can assist the Royal Commission as we, as we go through some of its elements. And I won't go to all of it, but if um, it's a lecture 49 of the policy and procedure bundle. It's also in KA11, but um, I'll just... We have uh, tab 49 there. So, so you'll see that this is the administration manual of May 1999. Do you recognise that? That's correct. All right. So if we go to um, page 4, ringtail 30, of that document... Scroll down to the administration of discipline. We'll see that the discipline of ministers with an ordained minister's certificate and an associate minister's certificate is the responsibility of the National Ministerial Committee of the Assemblies of God or the National Executive. Do you see that? Yes. And then lesser forms of certificates are the responsibility of the state executive. That's correct. And then, then there's Article 8 of the National Bylaws covers this issue, and I'll just go over the page to issuance and suspension of certificates. And we'll see there at paragraph B that ordained ministerial certificates are issued and may be suspended or withdrawn by the National Ministerial Committee on the recommendation of the State Executive. Do you see that? That's correct. So um, an ordained ministerial certificate was what uh, Frank, the fa uh, Pastor Frank Houston held um, in 1999, is that right? Yes, that's right. All right, and the same for, I, I presume, yourself and um, Pastor Brian Houston. That's others. correct. Yes. And uh, then it says, in C, in extreme and emergency cases, where there is sufficient evidence of serious breach of ministerial conduct... The state president, together with the national president, has the power to suspend ministerial certificates for a period of 30 days. Do you see that? Yes, that's right. All right. And that's the power that um, I think you referred to earlier as having been exercised by um, Pastor Brian Houston to suspend his father's certificate. Is that right? That's right. Now, if we can go over to the next page, we'll see at the towards the bottom uh, heading extent of discipline. And 
And you'll see there, it says at the second sentence of that first paragraph under extent of discipline, in relation to moral failure involving sexual misconduct, there are particular legal and moral constraints that require a detailed policy. This policy document can be used as a guide for all cases of the discipline of ministers, but it is mandatory for those cases relating to serious sexual misconduct. Do you see that? Yes. All right. So that's correct, is it not, that um, as at December 1999, it was mandatory for these provisions to be applied to a case of serious sexual misconduct? That's correct. Um, and it says, sexual misconduct covers a whole range of behaviours from inappropriate speech and communication to intercourse and perverse activities, such as those listed in Appendix 1. Now, um, I've had a look at Appendix 1, and on page 19 of that document, sexual molestation of a child is listed as a perverse activity. Do you see that? Yes. And you agree that's a reasonable interpretation? Yes, that's right. All right. Um, and then there's a power there at the bottom of that paragraph. The national executive has the right to intervene if it appears this discipline inappropriate. Do you see that? Yes. But otherwise, apart from those cases where the national executive in intervenes, it's the state executive that has responsibility. Except that there had been precedents where for cases of prominent ministers, the national executive had exercised the discipline process. Yes, and I'll take you to that at some stage, but, or maybe I'll address it right now. What, at what stage was the complaint against Pastor Frank Houston escalated to the national executive? At the point that the... Well, the national executive meeting was called... And under the, the chairmanship of John Lewis, it was determined that it was appropriate for it to be dealt with at a national level. All right, but uh, you'd agree that up until that stage, Brian Houston, the national president of the Assemblies of God, had been dealing with the matter. I object to that. that that's not consistent with Mr McMartin's uh, evidence or the evidence of Ms Taylor. Mr McMartin was the state president, yes. state executive. Well, it's consistent with uh, Mr Houston's, uh, Brian Houston's statement, that is to say he had uh, received the information and that he had taken steps to speak with his father about it. Um, well, I'm happy to... I'll clarify that particularly. Um, so, did you understand that... Sorry, I'll withdraw that. What was Pastor Brian Houston's role in the... Uh, handling of the complaint prior to the meeting on the 22nd of December 1999? The matter had been referred to him both oh, in, in three terms, effectively. He was the national president of the ACC. He was also the, the senior, of the past, senior pastor of the Hillsong Church, which by that time was connecting with the, um, oh, sorry, it wasn't Hillsong Church, it was the CLC Church in Hills, which was connected with CLC Church in the city at that point, and also as the, um, the son of Frank Houston, but principally was as the national president. And uh, did you form a view that by the 22nd of December 1999 he had taken the lead role in handling um, the complaint from, of uh, child sexual abuse against his father? He was the only one who was aware of it prior to that time. I think you said earlier that, uh, that Mr Alcorn became aware of it, um, having spoken to Mr McMartin. Is that wrong? No, sorry, uh, but his advice was simply to go to go to Brian Houston as the national president. His advice? Are you talking about Mr McMartin's advice? No, Mr Alcorn's advice to Mr McMartin. All right, I see. Thank you. All right. Now, if we just go over the page, and I know the time you're on, but um, if I could just finish this point. In fact, I have 
finish that point. So I wonder if that's a, wonder if that's a suitable time. Right. Can I just raise a matter, Your Honour? Yes. And it's just about the transcript. Uh, we have the great fortune of uh, seeing it typed up as it occurs, but there is a statement made by this witness about the age of the complainant, saying that he was above the age of 30, but it's recorded as 13 here. Uh, I've just raised that. Uh, if everyone could check the transcript, perhaps, uh, overnight. So do you mean above the age of 30? At the time the complaint was made, he was above the age of 30. I understand. Three zero. Sorry? Three zero. Three zero. I understood 13 was relevant to the legal advice. I certainly heard 30. Uh, but yeah, it depends which part of the evidence about the age. Well, uh, I'm, that can be clarified overnight, I think, Your yes. Honour, and we can take it up in the morning if this while we can sort out whatever the issue was. Do you recall you recall that question being put to you and the answer that you gave, Pastor? Yeah, my, my recollection is that the um, it was in relation to why we didn't go to the police yes. as the ACC, and the reason that I gave was the complainant at the time of the complaint was over the age of 30 and was in a position to make his own choice in yes. relation to that and that was the advice that we had. That's right. So there's, um, that, that's, that's, it was really only a matter of clarifying the evidence yeah. of Mr, uh, of Pastor Ange rather than the state of the law. Um, so. I'm not sure if that, that assists you, doesn't it? It does. I, yes, thank you, Your Honour. Right. So, Pastor, you understand that you're required to return tomorrow? Yes, we'll that's correct. We'll resume at 10. Thank, thank you. you.